Right. Well, uh, <clears throat> we'll make we'll make a start then. So, good evening and welcome to uh, tonight's meeting of the Rushcliffe Borough Council Planning Committee. Uh, this, like most meetings at the moment, is being held remotely, uh, with members and officers working from their homes. So, um, hopefully, the technology will hold up and. I'm sure people will understand if there are occasional little freezes or blips or whatever. Uh, this is the first meeting of the full planning committee since we started working this way uh, uh, a month or two ago. So uh, consequently, there are more uh, faces on the screen. Uh, for the benefit of uh, anybody who may be watching us on YouTube, and we are transmitting on YouTube, uh, both live and it will be uh, available afterwards. Uh, just so people know who, who is who, uh, I'm Councillor Richard Butler, I'm the Chairman of the Planning Committee, and colleagues on the Planning Committee are Councillor Mrs Stockwood, who is my, the Vice Chairman of the Committee, uh, Councillor uh, Clark, Goland, Healy, Major, Murray, Purdue Horan, Thomas, and Councillor John Stockwood. And uh, I'm not sure if Councillor Brennan is with us yet, but uh, Councillor yes. yes. oh, Councillor. So Councillor Brennan's here as well. So that's good. And and officers, we have Mr. Pegram, who is the service manager for communities, and he will be talking us through tonight's planning application. <laughs> and also with us is Mrs. Soul, who is the borough solicitor. Um, if uh, I, I know most of us, in fact, all of us have uh, done at least one of these video online meetings before. So uh, I think we're fairly familiar with the technology and the protocol. And uh, when people wish to speak, because we can see all people on the screen at the moment, I think it's probably sufficient if people literally raise their hand in the traditional way, as opposed to using the electric hand uh, or the, on the online uh, hand. Uh, right, so there's, I think that's the, um, uh, the domestics, uh, so to speak, out of the way, so we'll uh, start the meeting formally now uh, as per the agenda. And item one is apologies for absence and substitute members, please. Um, apologies from Councillor Verdi, substitute as Councillor John Stockwood. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor uh, John Stockwood, for joining us. And uh, do we have any declarations of interest? No, I don't think I see any of there. And uh, oh, sorry, I should have said under the code of conduct or uh, and or under the planning code. I don't think there are any declarations there. Uh, so we'll go on to item three, which is the minutes of the meeting held on the 11th of June, uh, which you've got copies of. Are, are you happy that th those of us who were here or those of you who were there, uh, are you happy that those are correct and uh, should be approved? Can we just have a show of hands. Uh, okay, thank you very much. So I will take those minutes as being approved. Uh, right, so we'll go into the main reasons for being here tonight. We have uh, four planning applications to discuss and decide tonight, and uh, they are listed on the agenda. And we'll go to the first one, which is the uh, Homefield Cottage, London Lane, Willoughby on the Wolds, and this is the demolition of an existing agricultural building and construction of a, de a detached dwelling. And um, Mr. Pegram, if you would talk us through this, please. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. I'll just share my screen with you. Um, hopefully now you can see uh, the title screen for this item, Homefield Cottage, Willoughby on the Wolds. Um, this is uh, an application uh, which seeks full planning permission for a residential dwelling um, in this area here. Um, London Lane is to the west and the site would be accessed from a driveway, um, a shared access with Holmfield Cottage and then along a driveway to the rear part of the site here where the dwelling would be located. Um, that gives you a flavour for the uh, location of the site in relation to the, the wider village. So that's, I'm indicating now with the arrow where the site is. This is uh, looking from London Lane. So this is looking at the access uh, which would go into the site. And then uh, north of the access, looking back down the lane. 
Um, this is an older picture um, taken when we dealt with a previous application. Um, part of the requirements for the highway visibility was the removal of, of this tree. So that's been removed to satisfy the, the highway requirements. Uh, still there on that, that picture, but you'll see in the subsequent picture that that tree has been removed now. That's now uh, looking south directly down uh, London Lane, and you can see this is where the tree was, which has now been removed, obviously with the permission of the Highway Authority. And then looking directly into the access um, for the site. So this is the current access that serves Bonfield Cottage and would also serve the, the proposed dwelling. That stood within the access, looking effectively northerly, so that's the direction back into the village. And then looking the other way down southerly out of the village. And you'll note there is a, a footpath uh, that actually runs through uh, adjacent to the application site. That now stood on the track which would give access to the application site. So Holmfield Cottage is just over the left shoulder of the photographer in this shot. Um, and the barn is behind these trees that would be demolished to make way for the, the dwelling. That is the, the barn that would be demolished uh, and the proposed dwelling would sit roughly in a uh, similar, similar position to that barn, uh, further away from the northern boundary. Uh, on this part, the uh, lean to section, uh, that part of the site effectively from there back to the west uh, would be incorporated into the garden of Holmfield Cottage. And then looking more in a westerly direction, so picking up Holmfield Cottage back down the access drive uh, to London Lane with the barn on the right. And that's just looking through uh, the boundary treatment to Holmfield Cottage. And again, just a different picture picking up uh, the, the location of that property. Again, just standing on the southern side of the access track, looking back towards London Lane. So Holmfield Cottage, you can just see behind the trees. Uh, and on this one, the barn that would be demolished is over the right-hand shoulder of the, the case of the uh, photographer. This is now taken from uh, neighbouring land. Um, there was permission previously for two dwellings constructed, as you can see, uh, and you can now pick up the barn within the application site. And then looking across the boundary treatment at the end of the barn that would be removed. And again, just showing you that relationship between the two properties. These are taken from south of the site, looking north. So you've got Holmfield Cottage. This is the boundary with London Lane. Uh, you can just see on the right hand side of that picture, the barn that would be removed. And again, standing uh, uh, outside the, the field, looking back up towards where the barn is and Holmfield Cottage. Um, and that is the um, site layout plan as existing, as you can see with the barn in position. Um, that's the lean-to I mentioned, which would be um, that area of land would be taken into the, the garden area of Holmfield Cottage. And then the proposal is for a, a new dwelling, a four bedroom dwelling in this location with access as I've described along the access track uh, with a parking and turning area and a garden area to the front or largely to the front of the property. Uh, those are the details. Um, almost so trying to replicate the barn appearance. Um, you can see obviously the main outlook from that building would be south over the fields. Um, obviously ground floor would have the uh, dining room, kitchen, utility room, etc., with four bedrooms at first floor. Um, as I say, all of the, the uh, principal windows would face south. Um, the windows on the rear are more bathroom and uh, bathroom and those types of ensuite rooms. And again, just a topographical survey showing the, the proposed dwelling. Um, you can see here, Chairman, on the left, um, the proposed dwelling would be slightly higher than the existing barn. 
and that's achieved obviously through the design of the building but also through digging the the, the, the uh, dwelling into the slope slightly um, so that it tries to uh, minimize impact in terms of its uh, you know, view across the field. Um, Chairman, you will have seen from the, the history of this uh, application in the report that permission was previously refused for four dwellings um, on a larger site, but including this area. The fundamental consideration on, on this application um, is, sorry, you can see that, I'll get rid of that and why that came up. Um, the fundamental consideration on this application um, is whether the site uh, constitutes infill development. Um, clearly, under policy three of the core strategy, Willoughby on the Wolds is not identified. As Thank a you. Okay, bye -bye. And therefore, the, um, the other consideration uh, applies, which is limited infilling within the village. Um, as I say, the previous application was refused because it was believed that it uh, encroached into the countryside and was not within the village. And you'll see the comments of the inspector um, in paragraphs 18 and 19, um, where he took the view that this was not in the village, it was in the countryside. Um, and therefore, the only exception in this location would be limited infilling in, in the village. Um, yes, there is development to the north, um, you've got Holmfield Cottage to the west, um, but again, as the inspector noted, there's nothing to the um, east, nothing to the south. Um, paragraph 3.10 of our part two local plan um, describes limited infilling, small scale infilling as development in small gaps within existing built fabric of the village or previously developed sites. So this chairman does not satisfy the requirement for limited infilling um, and on that basis it's before you with a recommendation to refuse planning permission. Thank you. Right, thank you Mr Pecker and thank you very much. Now in line with the uh, recent changes to the way that uh, we can uh, uh, operate the committee we are able to have uh, external and public speakers on uh, planning applications and we have two speakers for this application tonight uh, for this uh, particular application. Uh, first of all I have Judy Carr who is the applicant's agent. So is Judy online with us? I am. Right. Counselor, yes. Thank you. Um, I'm sure <laughs> it's all been explained to you uh, but uh, you have up to five minutes to address, to talk to the committee. And um, if you're still talking at five minutes, we, we have to be quite strict and say time's up. Fine. Um, you will get, uh, the, the, borough, the borough solicitor will tell you when you've got 30 seconds late. So four, four minutes, 30 seconds, she'll tell you 30 <laughs> seconds to go. Okay. Uh, so, and your time will start, the, the, the uh, five minutes start as soon as you start talking to the committee. So as soon as you're ready, um, you can uh, start talking. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to speak this evening. This application is for the replacement of an agricultural building with a smaller dwelling on the same footprint in the village of Willoughby on the Wolds. The application is by a local family and if permitted will benefit a key member of the local community who's desperate to stay in the village following divorce. It is our view that the existing agricultural building which lies within two metres of the nearest house forms part of the built up area of the village. This building's been on the site for at least 40 years and others before it. Anyone living in neighbouring buildings, walking across nearby footpaths or driving into the village along London Lane would see the existing barn as part of the built fabric of the village. A new building of a similar size and scale on the same footprint cannot therefore be said to extend the built up area. The officer report concludes that the development would erode a well-defined boundary to the settlement but as can be seen on the aerial photographs, a replacement building in this location would not erode a well-defined boundary. It is the boundary. There would therefore be no extension of the built-up part of the village further into the countryside, nor would it affect the pattern or character of the area. The development will therefore comply with the definition of infill in the Rushcliffe local plan, paragraph 3.10, which says, small scale infilling is considered to be the development of small gaps within the existing built fabric of the village, or previously development sites. The policy is clear. There's no requirement that the sites needs to be previously developed to be included in the built up area. 
The officer report relies heavily on the recent appeal decision for four houses on the site, which includes the current application site. The appeal site was much bigger and included an additional field. These four houses did extend into the open countryside, so it's reasonable that the inspector agreed it would harm the character and appearance of the rural area. But this application is very different. None of the reasons given by the inspector apply to a sympathetically designed building built on the same footprint and smaller in size than the building it replaces. There's no loss of open countryside and no harm to the rural appearance of the area. The officer report states that this plot cannot be considered as previously developed land and that it should be considered greenfield. But when permission was granted in 2015 for five dwellings at Church Farm in Willoughby, the site was described in the delegated report as not strictly brownfield land. And because the site wouldn't project further into the open countryside than the existing buildings, it wasn't considered harmful to the character or form of the settlement. And while this application predate, uh, that application predates the local plan, the overarching strategy of supporting applications which do not harm the character or form of settlement is still in place and applies here. The officer report is concerned that the paraphernalia of a domestic house on the site will harm the enjoyment of the footpath. However, the landscape officer, the rights of way officer and the Knotts Wildlife Trust, none of those had objections. Um, nonetheless, additional screening could be introduced by way of condition to address that concern. Um, there, there is a concern about the lack of capacity of the main sewer in the village. It's not a planning issue, but again, if a private sewer could be accommodated on this site, that could be imposed by condition, which might address that concern. There's no formal local house, housing needs survey that's happened in Willoughby. However, in 2012, a comprehensive village survey and the resulting village <coughs> plan records a concern that people employed locally in low paid jobs are unable to find housing in the village. The reason for seeking development on land within the applicant's family's ownership is to provide funding which will prevent the occupier of Homeful Cottage, who is a low earner, being forced to sell a house and move somewhere she can afford to buy. She's been caretaker of the village hall for 20 years and she lives opposite and looks after her parents who live in the village. If there had been a housing needs survey, she would have identified herself as in need of low cost housing. She shouldn't be pen penalised by the fact that no local needs assessment has been carried out. In conclusion, the application site is within the built up area of the village, as by its very nature, it is a building. A new building on the same site can therefore be regarded as infill as per Rushcliffe's own definition. There's no harm done to a natural rural location, and it cannot therefore be said that the proposal would cause significant harm to the character and appearance of the local area. No important views or vistas will be lost. There'll be no loss of open countryside. The proposal is positively supported by local residents, by ward councillors, and there's a strong local collection which addresses a local need, and we urge you to approve this planning application. Thank you. Uh, okay. OK, thank you, uh, Mrs Carr. That was just within your five minutes, so thank you very much for that. Uh, our second speaker on this item is one of the local ward members, uh, Councillor Eddie Bean. So, uh, Councillor Eddie Bean, I think you're here. So uh, you're very familiar with the um, uh, with the process. So you have five minutes again from when you start talking. Can I ask, have, have I been unmuted? You, we can hear you, yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, members of the committee, you've heard from the applicant's agent with some very strong arguments um, on local policy and the fact that this is an infill site. And I would reiterate all of the policy points that have been made. I'd also like to make reference to Chestnut Close, which was referred to. This was an old barn um, outside of the village and now has five houses on it. And again, it was a, it was a, it was a, a, a well needed, if you like, development in the village. Over the last few years, there have been other developments in Willoughby, which have had significantly more on impact on the character of the village than this application would have. And last time I was in front of the committee, I was objecting to a potential development almost adjacent to this site that would, have that would heap further pressure on our already overloaded ancient sewage system. So I particularly welcome the fact that I understand that this development, if allowed, could offer its own sewage treatment capability without the need to connect to the existing system. In my support of this application, I mentioned that I only registered my support 
when it became apparent that it was likely to be recommended for refusal. When I first saw it, I saw no reason th that this would be the case. I firmly believe that this application already sits within the defined boundary of the village and it would improve the vista of the village compared to having an old barn in close proximity to existing and to be built housing. This surely must be one of those occasions where black and white policies fail to take account of needs of a small community. There are no objections to this application, which in itself should tell you that the community does not agree with the supposition that, that, that this does not constitute an infill site. Believe me, the residents of Willoughby would soon make their feelings known if it was considered inappropriate. The report suggests that the inspector's report on the previous application should be given much weight. And I again will stress that this application is for one house standing on an already clearly defined plot, as opposed to four new houses that have pushed out into the adjacent fields. It should also be noted that this application, given the timing in relation to lockdown, has most likely not benefited from a site visit, instead relying on photographs from the previous application or previous knowledge of the site. And I'd ask the question, what do you do with an agricultural building that has had development granted on nearly three sides of it? I imagine someone deciding to keep pigs, for example, and the, would not go down well with the impact that that would have on the existing two adjacent houses and the five that could be built as planning permission has been granted. I would also like to point out in the presentation from, from Mr. Pegram that the tree that has been removed, it, yes, it has been removed, but it was removed by the highway authority as it was a danger to traffic. It was not removed by the applicant. Finally, I too would like to repeat that the applicant's daughter lives in Homefield Cottage and that approval of this application will allow, allow her to remain in the village instead of having to sell the house as a result of divorce proceedings, which she has not instigated. She's lived in the village most, if not all, of her life. She works in the village. She cares for her elderly parents who live in the village. She has, one, she has, as one of her jobs, looked after the village hall opposite for 20 years. And she is on a low income and cannot afford another house in the village, so would therefore have to leave the village. Their loss to the village would be significant, as well as having a devastating impact on her life and ability to earn a living. So I implore you as well to grant this application for the sake of common sense. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Councillor Eddie-Bean. That's, uh, uh, again, well within the five minutes. Uh, so uh, we, we have no other speakers on this. Mr Pegram, would you like to pick up on the points that have been raised by Mrs Carr and Councillor Eddyveen, uh, that they're, they're strongly of the opinion that uh, the, this application being for a single building, single house, shouldn't be treated in the same way as a previous application for four, uh, which also that application was covering a wider area and this is on a same footprint as, as the barn. Um, they're very strong, the barn has been there for 40 years or more and uh, they're both very strongly of the opinion that uh, it's, uh, uh, the application could or should be regarded as uh, infill. Um, there's some comparison to a similar development application from a few years ago. I know we can't really discuss previous applications, uh, previous uh, different sites, but there, it was referred to. Um, there's, uh, and uh, it's, I, I wonder also the, there had been some, concerns from various people about sewerage etc but uh, they're uh, telling us that this would be in effect on a pro have a private arrangement i think that's picked up most of the points so if, if you just come back on those please thank you chairman yes um, I, I will start by saying as we always say each application has to be considered on its merits um, i fully accept that the previous scheme uh, which was refused and dismissed at appeal was for a larger development um, and arguably encroached further into the countryside um, however chairman um, i still remain of the view which i'll explain in more detail in a moment why we believe that this is still encroachment into the countryside um, 
the, the applicant's agent made reference to the fact that the existing building um, forms part of the fabric of the, the village. Um, Chairman, it, it, this is not pre -developed, uh, previously developed land. The MPPF definition of previously developed land specifically excludes um, agricultural land and buildings. Uh, if I can just uh, share my screen with you again, just to uh, highlight this point. Um, hopefully now you can see the aerial photograph of the, the area. Um, the building in question is the one we're looking at here. Um, effectively, Chairman, that is an agricultural building which you would expect to see in the countryside and our own policies allow for um, appropriate agricultural development. So arguably, um, if an application came in for a barn down here, I'm not suggesting there is or it would, but if an application came in for a barn here and it was seen to serve an agricultural holding, um, that might be approved, but we wouldn't allow a dwelling in that location. So the fact there is an agricultural building on the site currently, uh, in my view, does not give any greater weight to whether or not this site is within the settlement. Um, arguably, Chairman, um, Holmfield Cottage is slightly further south, but I would argue that the effectively the built edge of the village is what I'm indicating now through that line. So where we've approved previous development, that was seen to be part of the fabric of the village. Um, if I can come back to the inspector's comments, admittedly on a larger scheme, I accept. Whilst the site is adjacent to Holmfield Cottage and some new dwellings on one site, on one side, there are no buildings on the other side. Of the site only open fields that extend to the roadside with back lane. It goes on at paragraph 19 that we've highlighted. So I find that the proposed development would be in the countryside, in a countryside location beyond the built up limits of the village. So clearly, Chairman, our view is that this site is not within the fabric of the village, it is in the countryside. Um, do, 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 do. Not previously developed land I've covered. Chairman, the fact that there are no objections from other parties, as, as I've said before in these meetings, is not reason uh, to grant planning permission, obviously. Similarly, uh, planning is a land-based discipline. Um, it's nothing to do with the applicant, who they are, where they live, um, and to some extent, what their needs might be. So although very sympathetic to uh, the uh, needs of the applicant and where she finds herself, but that is not a reason for granting planning permission where you wouldn't normally grant permission. Um, the sewerage issue, Chairman, hasn't been raised by us as part of this application. It's a single dwelling, um, but that would largely be dealt with by, by building regulations. Um, we do have a policy, Chairman. We talked about, um, I think Councillor Eddie Veen and the, the um, person speaking made reference to needs of the village and the fact that no needs assessment has been undertaken. We do have a specific policy um, which might allow exception needs housing in a village and we've got a number of schemes throughout the borough where that's actually been delivered. Uh, that would normally follow a, a housing needs survey and would be aimed at people on lower incomes who, who may want to remain in the village, but that is a separate planning consideration. Um, Councillor Reddyveen made reference to the Chestnut Close development, again as you've been I haven't got the details of that in front of me. I don't know the specific details, but clearly um, each application has to be considered on its own on, on its own merits. Um, just to clarify, our officer did carry out a site visit. Although we are in COVID with lots of uh, restrictions, my officers are still carrying out site visits. So they would have seen the site um, currently uh, as an up-to-date. Um, Just to clarify, Chairman, I wasn't trying to suggest that the applicant had removed the tree. Um, that was removed by the Highway Authority. Clearly, it's on their highway maintainable land, um, but it was highlighted both in the previous application and in this one that it would need to be removed um, to uh, achieve an acceptable visibility. So, as I say, not suggesting for one minute that's an act of the applicant, um, but that was highlighted as a need following the consultation with the Highway Authority. Um, thank you, Chairman. Okay, thank you, Mr. Pegram. Uh, so we now come to a point where we need to open up for members to uh, 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 make points, ask questions, and ultimately come to a decision. So um, who would like to, oh, sorry, Mrs. Soule, you're indicating to speak. 
Apologies, Chai. If I can just address uh, Councillor Murray, because you joined the meeting slightly late and missed the majority of the presentation, if you can abstain from participating in this item. Uh, we, we didn't hear you then, Councillor Murray, but, so, but I assume you, you're, you agree with that. You, Uh, you're on mute. Uh, yes, no, yes. sorry, I was on mute. Uh, yeah, no, I agree with that. That's fine. So you, so you understand. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, Chair. Uh, right, so we will now open to members of the committee to uh, to uh, start the discussion. Councillor Goland, you've indicated to speak. Hi, um, I'm looking at the aerial view of this village and this site. And unfortunately, the, the aerial view that um, Mr. Peckham showed didn't show the two new houses that have been built to the north of that barn, um, I think, as far as I could see. And if I draw a line directly from the cottage and the, on London Lane to the last cottage on Main Street, um, this site lies within it. So I, I can't really see how that, um, I mean, I can share my screen with you if you want, but I'm not sure you don't. Um, but I can't quite see how this is not infill. Um, the photograph, Mr. Pegram, have you, uh, you the aerial photograph that uh, Councillor Golan, have we got that? And, there, Chairman. So, so is that helpful, Councillor Golan? Do you want to, I know you haven't, Got no way of pointing at it, but um, your your point being there is new there's new houses already there that are not on the photograph. Yeah, just to the north of the grey barn. Just roughly where the hand is now. Yeah. Yes, uh, is chairman. that correct, Mr. Pegram? Yes, Chairman. There are two new houses in there. Uh, there, there's a third one approved here, and then there's an approval on this site for additional uh, developments. However, Chairman. Uh, the view is that effectively the north boundary of Holmville Cottage and the application site effectively form the boundary with the um, built development. Uh, to be infill, you'd need development here and possibly even here to justify it. Clearly, I, I, I'm not sure where Councillor Gowland was referring to, but in my view, this building does not, or this site does not sit between existing buildings. It, it is an encroachment into the field. Okay, e even though we, although they're not on this photograph, even though there are new houses there and, and other new houses to come a little bit further north. Yeah, they're, they're further north, Chairman, and arguably um, it, it is a fine line, but um, once you cross that northern boundary, my view is you do enter um, what I would say is the, the built part of the village. Okay, Councillor Golan, do you want to come back on that? Um, I was comparing it with the line, you know, if you zoom out a little bit, the line to the road opposite Main Street, which is the road running down on the right hand side of the plot, uh, the, the map at the moment, the, the figure at the moment. Bear with me a second, Chairman, I'll see if I can get that. So I've zoomed out slightly, and there's yes. the application site. So I'm looking over to the right hand side where the road curves round and the village extends on that side. Yeah, there, there was actually a previous application in this location as well, which I, I think it was there, which was refused. Um, but again, that's such a distance. You, as I say, it's, it's not within the built fabric of the settlement and not therefore considered to be an infill. <coughs> okay, thank you. Right, thank you. Um, do you any other points on that, Councillor Goland, or is that it for now? Okay, uh, right, um, uh, Councillor, uh, Councillor Thomas. Sorry, I lost my cursor for a minute then, I couldn't unmute. And um, I've got three questions really, um, <coughs> for Mr. Pegram. The first is, does the dwelling have sufficient outdoor space um, in terms of policies, um, restrictive policies? The second is, what is the significance of the outdoor space in terms of the impact on the countryside? And um, the third is, is the area in front of the barn currently used for parking for home field cottage? And if so, is there sufficient parking for this cottage if this development went ahead? Okay, thank you, Councillor Thomas. 
so uh, query about outdoor space, how does it fit in with policies and uh, the impact on the countryside and, and what's the parking arrangements? Thank you. Yeah, chairman. Yeah. I will. <coughs> So hopefully, Chairman, you can all now see um, the light layout plan that's proposed. Um, it, no, it doesn't affect Holmfield Cottage. Holmfield Cottage has its own parking, doesn't rely on, on this land um, as part of its curtilage or parking. Um, in terms of the available amenity space, uh, I haven't calculated it, Chairman, so I don't know what the square meterage is. Um, Arguably, it's, it's slightly further off the boundary than the barn, so there's area to the rear, although that's not ideal prime amenity space. The main amenity space would be effectively as I'm indicating on the plan now. So that area there, so a patio with a, a garden area. Um, in terms of the significance of the impact on the countryside, obviously with residential, um, you're not only talking about the building, um, you've got the cars, you've got potentially a garden shed, you might have children's play equipment, um, tables and chairs, that type of uh, paraphernalia is what we refer to. There's a public footpath that effectively runs through the site across in that sort of rough location. And there are also um, other um, public footpaths to the east and south. So clearly um, that would bring um, more clutter and visual impact into, into the visible to those users of the footpath. Thank you, yeah. Councillor Thomas. Does That's that fine, thank you. Yeah, okay. thank you. Yeah, um, thank you. Is anyone else wishing to ask any questions? Or, uh, uh, Councillor Clark. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman. Uh, yeah, I do remember the previous application uh, for this site for the four houses, uh, and I remember us uh, discussing it in the committee then, and um, I was uh, actually in favour of that application, and I haven't changed my view on this one. In fact, uh, the proposal as presented to us now, it's actually entrenched my view, to be honest. Um, it's a completely different application to the previous one that was uh, for four houses uh, but when you read in the report for instance on page 23 paragraph 55 and I quote the proposal would cause significant harm to the character and appearance of the local area come on uh, there is no way that this proposal is going to cause significant harm to the character and, and appearance of the local area uh, I'd be helpful if uh, could Mr. Pegram just put up the uh, satellite view again that he had up before? Uh, I'm, I'm going to, for those of you old enough to remember the golden shot, I'm, I'm going to be doing a bit of a, a left and a right <laughs> and an up and a down and <laughs> with, with the cursor. I don't know if I need a bolt. Something <laughs> like that. And also, if you could tell that fly to go away as well. Um, right. I, I have to zoom yep. in a little bit. Uh, or not. <laughs> I'll take that as a no then. Yes. Oh, that's, that's perfect. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah. That's perfect. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Uh, right. So uh, a starting point, and I'll have to say, and uh, the, the evidence is only two, well, about two or maybe three hours old now, but I uh, just to make sure I was right and I drove down there um, two or three hours ago and if you bring the cursor right down London Lane almost to the whoa back up stop right on the left there is a hedge it's domesticated and that is the start of the domesticated garden to the house that is then another 50 yards or whatever it is uh, north just below the H of Homefield Farm and that is completely uh, domesticated residential dwelling. So as far as I'm concerned, I mean, okay, I could be charitable and say, it's just that house is the limit of development, but actually because the hedge is extremely well uh, managed and domesticated, in my view, uh, the start of development is at the very Southern edge of that hedge and garden area. Um, 
But even if you were to say that the limit of the village was on the right hand side, uh, I'm afraid I completely disagree with Mr. Pegram's um, assertion that the boundary was where he previously indicated. If he just moves, he disappears, it's gone. Whoa, that's it. That, in my view, this driveway, and if you just go up, follow the, uh, the shrubs on this uh, right hand driveway, as far as I'm concerned, that is the line on the right hand side of the lane um, of development if you were uh, being really hard hearted. But as I say, as far as I'm concerned, it's down at the, uh, the, the southern uh, bottom uh, edge where the domesticated hedges. Now, public perception of Brownfield is totally um, confusing anyway. Uh, and then to say that uh, an agricultural building that's been there for 40 years it is not uh, Brownfield. Um, I think that was the phraseology that Councillor Edivine used, black and white. I mean, there has to be some pragmatism in uh, planning, and it's time we had pragmatism in planning. Um, so, in my view, this development or proposal is absolutely uh, on the edge of the village and within the village. And there is no way that anybody could possibly construe that if this development took place, that it's going to extend the line of the village, because quite plainly, it isn't, because it's exactly in line with Homefield Cottage. Um, so for me, it absolutely fits the bill. Uh, one of the comments from the local residents of general public on paragraph 37 F the comment says that it will add to the sustainability of our village as it is suitable for a low income family. So you can argue that it is sustainable anyway. Um, and it is within the village. I think that it would be quite wrong to uh, refuse this application. Uh, I mean, I'd be quite prepared to actually move that uh, we approve, uh, that we give planning approval to this uh, application. Uh, subject to, and I'm quite happy, all the usual uh, sort of conditions that go with um, with that. And also, I'm quite happy, uh, I, somebody's already mentioned drainage, I'm quite happy if um, there was a condition that it wasn't connected to the mains drainage if they needed to. Well, that, that's subject to debate, and I'll be here to, uh, happy to hear other people's comments on that. But I'm, I'm going to move that we actually approve this application, Mr Chairman. Okay, thank you, Councillor Clark. Um, just before I see if you have a second, a second for that, Mr. Pedro, is, are you looking at me as if you want to just point something out, or yes, please, Chairman. Yeah, yeah. Um, just to to pick up on the two points that Councillor Clark made. Firstly, it's not me not being pragmatic or using common sense. Um, the MPPF is quite clear that brownfield land or previously developed land does not include agricultural land and buildings. So however long this building has been on the site, its lawful use is as agricultural buildings or building um, and therefore does not qualify as previously developed land. So as I say, that is national policy, not my policy. Um, just in terms of the um, Councillor Clark took us through uh, or took us on a journey up London Lane um, and said that the interview, the domesticated or the built form of the village started on the left, as we indicated. I won't bring the, the, the plan up again. But again, I just draw members' attention to paragraph 18 and the inspector's comments where he says, furthermore, despite the village hall and other, other dwellings on the opposite side of London Lane and other permissions granted nearby for housing, the proposed development would not square off the village as the appellant suggests. Well, that was on the previous one, obviously, Chairman. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Pegram. Uh, Ms., uh, I, I can see Councillor Brennan indicated to speak, but I can also see Mrs. Soul. Uh, Mrs. Soul, are you wanting to come in with a, a legal thing? Yeah. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, just in terms of before we move to any further debate, can we clarify whether there's a seconder for Councillor Clark's motion? All oh, right, okay. Councillor Brennan. Okay, that's fine. If that's what Councillor Brennan's intention is, that's fine. It's, I understand it's a procedural thing. I, I accept it for that. So, Councillor Brennan. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. 
Okay, well, I was going to say, um, I endorse everything Councillor Clark said about this application. I would also add my own sense of frustration that here we are again, where we are approving four or 500 houses in green belts, completely changing the character of many of the villages around Rushcliffe forever. Um, and when we get small applications for bespoke properties on or in, around or on the edge of the villages, which is how villages organically have grown over the ages, rather than 400 identical houses on the corner of the village completely changing its character forever, we have to say no. And I realise that's not Mr Pegram's fault. I realise this is the planning system that we have to operate in. But sometimes there does come a point when you have to say, we need to draw a line under this madness. We can't, I can't in all consciousness say, yes, 400 identical boxes on Crown land or Greenbelt land in Radcliffe on Trent, but no, this property cannot be built at this site. So therefore I would like to second uh, the, the, mo the proposal that we okay, agree well, the recommendation. Well, well, Right, thank you. Well, 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 although you've referred to other applications and uh, possibilities, as ever, we can only look at and discuss the application that we're looking at at the moment. I know I sound like a broken record when I say that. Uh, Mr. Sol, is that what you were going to tell me, tell us? Yes, yeah. Chair, I was just going to reiterate that point. Thank you, Chair. But, but, uh, but I, 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 sorry, yes, Councillor Brennan. Yes, I acknowledge that point and I was speaking uh, for, as an individual, I recognise as a planning committee, we can't take account of it. However, the fact remains, I'd still like to, to second Councillor Clark's proposal that we approve this um, for planning I understand. Commission. Well, we've, we've got it proposed and seconded. Mr Pegram's wanted to come back. Thank you, Chairman. Um, just for the purpose of the minutes, it's been moved and seconded. Um, I will need a very clear indication from the mover and the seconder as to why they believe this development is acceptable and if I can just plant one further seed, why is this one acceptable? And I'm not suggesting it would happen, but if we move slightly further to the east, why another one wouldn't be equally as acceptable? So I need a clear indication why in this particular case, members arguably wish to depart from policy and grant permission for a building, which in my opinion is not clearly infill. Yeah, Mr. Chairman. Well, to to answer the second one, that that's uh, dead easy, isn't it? Uh, I, I'm afraid I can throw uh, Mr. Pegram's words straight back at him. Uh, each application is on its own merits, and uh, it's not for me to uh, predict or judge any other application which may or may not come for any other site uh, that is uh, in the proximity of this particular proposal site. Uh, in terms of uh, the reasons for approval, uh, it would be uh, because, in our opinion, the proposal would not cause significant harm to the character and appearance of the local area uh, and is not considered to be extending the uh, built up um, bound, whatever the built up line, the built up boundary. Uh, of uh, current dwellings uh, into open countryside. I just see further clarification, Chairman. Is, is Councillor Clark giving some weight to the presence of a building on the site already, whether it's agricultural or not? Um, well, uh, yes, I would say because there is, uh, um, Due to also the existing uh, structure of uh, a base, so there is engineering works already existing uh, and a building in place, uh, which therefore uh, means that it uh, is replacing uh, an existing building on the same on a similar footprint. Thank you, Chairman. Well, thank you, uh, Councillor Perdue Horror. It, was it Purdue, Councillor Perdue Horan indicating that? I see. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I hope I can be constructive and helpful uh, in finding a way through this. Um, I, I, I was told earlier this week that uh, we should build, 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 uh, and I come along this evening and we're refusing, refusing, refusing. But what's What's probably given us um, a reason to be sympathetic to this particular application 
because I'm minded to agree with Councillor Goland and uh, Councillor Clark. Um, in paragraph uh, 18, page 17, in the um, inspector's comments on a previous application, uh, he, 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 he says that um, there is no definition in Rushcliffe's policy as to what constitutes infill development. So, so we don't have a definition. This committee can take each application on its own merits and decide whether it is reasonable uh, to assume that it, that it qualifies broadly with our own thoughts on what is infill development and then, and I tend to agree with Councillor Clark that the, the 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 footpath up to the barn would would be a, a defendable line um, so so I'm minded to support the application okay thank you Councillor Perdue Horan well of course as we are often being often told at these meetings we are uh, decision makers and that's why we're here and uh, but also we have to look at all the the, the, the information and evidence before us and also have to remember that there are policies both local and national in place and it all has to be weighed up and that's why to coin a phrase that's very used a lot we have to make difficult decisions at times um, but Mr Pegram are you wanted to, I saw you wave it was a minor point of clarification chairman in response to the comments Councillor Perdue Horan made um, when the previous application was determined, and I think the appeal was determined, it was pre-adoption of part two of the local plan when, no, we didn't have any guidance or definition of infill. Um, as I referred to previously, we now have paragraph 3.10 of the local plan part two, which does provide some guidance as to what infill is. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hopefully, hopefully that helps. Um, uh, Councillor uh, uh, Thomas. You want to, are you coming back on this? Um, yes. Um, as there is clearly some harm to the countryside from this development, both in terms of the building and in terms of the garden and hard standing and parking and so on in front of it, I would like to propose an amendment to the um, motion to um, allow the um, application. Um, to provide um, a scheme for screening the development so that there would be no, um, to, re to reduce the impact on the footpath and uh, the, the um, visibility of the um, um, dwelling and the garden. Thank you. Right, so Mr. Pogan, would that, if, if, if we went down that route, would that in effect be a condition? Is that how? Um, that yeah, um, I'll take guidance from uh, Mrs. Soul if she wants to nod, but in my view, that's not an amendment. Um, we haven't yet discussed this issue, um, and I'm not sure whether, again, this is one where, if it is approved, members are willing to give officers a degree of latitude in terms of the conditions, but those are conditions that we would put on a permission anyway. So I've already scribbled down material landscaping um, I would suggest if it is approved chairman because of the nature of the development and the size of the plot we remove permitted development for um, extensions and outbuildings um, the drainage one is not particularly a, 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 a planning matter but if members are more comfortable that we try to control what happens with that uh, clearly that's something we could put on okay right thank you I've got councillor Boland and then councillor Clark councillor Boland um, just quickly, uh, can we add conditions on water recycling and um, uh, climate change proofing, as we have in the past and other properties? Electric vehicle charging points. And water recycling. Yeah, we've got that one. Okay, Councillor Clark. Uh, I was just going to say, Chairman, the reason I didn't uh, um, add what uh, Councillor Thomas uh, was suggesting was because I, when I made my comments, I said uh, subject to th the usual conditions and uh, my assumption was that uh, a landscaping scheme uh, approved by the Borough Council was one of them. So um, I hope that's um, sufficient. Right. You, had the, you, you had the assumption there that it would be included. Yeah, uh, Mrs. Snow. 
Uh, thank you, Chair. Can I just confirm with Councillor Thomas what, what her intention is with regards to the amendment? If she has continued to move it as an amendment, that will need a seconder, or if she now withdraws that? Uh, Councillor Thomas, could you just confirm that, whether you want to continue as an amendment or whether you withdraw it and have it as part of potential conditions? My suggestion was an amendment to ensure that it was included in conditions. I've got the motion, Chairman, to be voted. If members if, were minded to approve, it will be included. Yeah. So, I, so, I withdraw my amendment then. Thank you. Thank you. It will be a condition. Uh, right. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, Councillor John Stockwood. I'd just like to um, say a few points about policy. I think uh, for many years we didn't have any, and it's been very difficult in, at the borough for have, having um, the absence of strategy and policy. And now that we have policies, I'm, dis I'm dismayed actually to hear that we're, we're, we're not prepared to follow them. This is clearly not in fill according to the policy base which is spelled out quite clearly in national planning policy framework terms and in the inspector's decision, which was very recent. In terms of providing sustainable housing in small villages, we have the rural exception site policy. The rural exception site policy allows a landowner to say, I'd like to bring forward some affordable houses and that would be considered within the policy. That is not happening here. There is no suggestion that that is being offered. The, the local needs identified relate to one particular family, but there's no evidence that this is um, related entirely to that family's personal need uh, for now or in the future. Um, the, the, the evidence base is, is quite clear. And um, point one, I understand that um, at point two regarding the impact on the, uh, uh, on the perceived harm on the countryside could be mitigated through landscaping measures as pointed out by Councillor Thomas, and, that's, and I do hope that if it's approved that um, such um, conditions are placed on the, on the application. However, point one is a very clear point in policy, and um, for many years we've struggled without policies uh, because of the decisions of the Council. Now we have them, it's very important that we support them consistently, because there are a great deal, um, many similar decisions to be made all across the borough, and I think we need to be clear that we have definition of infill now and we have a definition of how we support local communities um, to provide small scale developments to meet local needs. That is not happening in this application and that is why this application should be refused. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor. Um, I, I shouldn't think anyone, Mr. President, needs to come back on that unless you want. No, I think, I, no. Uh, right. We, um, I sense there's not many other people wishing to speak on this, so we've um, we've had quite a good discussion on the application, and we've had a recommendation, um, a, which is obviously different from the one in the paper. So, uh, uh, and the recommendation has been moved and seconded to grant permission for uh, this application with conditions as discussed. Are we all clear on that? Um, I think we better. Unless anyone else wishes to come in on this, so we're we ready to go to a decision on this. I think, um, yeah, I, I think we're ready to go to a decision. So, the way this uh, works now is that the monitoring officer, the solicitor, uh, calls out um, uh, uh, each councillor's name for them to say whether they approve, whether they uh, um, uh, uh, approve or don't approve of the recommendation. So, and uh, the recommendation, just to be clear, is not as in your papers, but is to grant planning permission as discussed. So uh, this is a time now where we come to make a difficult decision. So if we go to the voting, please. Okay. Do, you do, do you do a roll call on this? It's all gone quiet. Sandy Frozen. Yeah, I think she has. <laughs> Perfect, Sandy. Yes, yeah, she has frozen, haven't she? That's interesting. Okay. Um, we'll, 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 how, about, how about just doing a hands up? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, she's uh, back. Uh, Mrs. Sold, we lost you for a moment then. Can't hear That's you. That's fine. Can you hear me now? Yeah. We, we lost, we, we, you frozen vision and we, we lost your sound as well. And, and I just got to a point where I think I've made it clear that we were going to go to a decision, a difficult decision uh, for the. Mo the, the, the motion's been proposed and seconded 
not as per the agenda, but as per the recommendation by Councillor Clark and Councillor um, Brennan, which is to grant permission. And I, and I think you were going to do a roll call of people in favour or not of that recommendation, I think. Thank you. I'll read all the names out um, alphabetically, and if you can just indicate whether you're for or against or opposing. So, Councillor Brennan? For. Councillor Butler? Against. Councillor Clark? For. Councillor Gowland? For. Councillor Healy? Councillor Heath, mute. My fault, four, thank you. Councillor Major? Four. Councillor Purdue Horan? Four. Councillor John Stockwood? Against. Councillor Maureen Stockwood? Muted. The Maureen Stockwood, you're on mute. Sorry, against. And Councillor Thomas. Against. Against, sorry. Sorry, Councillor Thomas, could you repeat that? Against. That's carried, Chair. So the recommendation as put, moved by Councillor Clark and seconded by Councillor Brennan is carried. So that means that permission is granted. Okay, thank you very much. Um, well, that's what we're here for. As I said earlier, we're here to make decisions and, and, uh, and I think we had a good discussion on that. So we move on to our next application, <clears throat> which is... Um, Keyworth, and this is uh, uh, Lilacs 28 Rose Grove, Keyworth. This is the erection of a two story detached uh, house with parking. And uh, again, Mr. Pegram, if you would talk us through this, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I hope you can see on the screen the title page for this application. Yes. Um, so the application in this instance seeks full planning permission. Um, for a detached dwelling um, on Rosegrove in Keyworth. Uh, there is a previous outline consent which is granted. Uh, that outline planning permission um, included four of the reserved matters, which included um, layout, access, scale, and landscaping. It did not include um, appearance. So clearly the principle of development has been established uh, on this plot. Uh, this is um, looking at the application or looking up the Rose Grove in a generally westly direction. Um, the property on the uh, right here is the neighbouring property to the application site and the application site is effectively um, their, uh, their garden area. That's now again moving further up into the end of the road. So the application site is on the right here. Um, this is the existing garage um, to number 28 uh, Rose Grove, uh, which would be demolished um, to make way for, for the proposed development. Um, again, just looking across, so you can now see the house um, with the, the garage and the application site is effectively behind the hedge. That's looking at properties on the opposite side of the road. And, and I would suggest, you know, as, as we move through these, members will note that there is a uh, a mix of character designs and styles of properties on this particular road. Some single storey, some chalet style and some full two storey properties. That's now looking uh, more down the road in an easterly direction. This is the properties on the opposite side of the road. So the application site is now behind the photographer. Again, looking down um, in a, an easterly direction um, this is a, a, a new property or relatively new property, uh, which is built within the grounds of number 26. Um, and also just to pick a reference point, Chairman, Briars Close, um, who you'll hear from one of the residents in a moment, runs through there. That's now looking full on at the pair of semis. So you can see um, the property that was approved next door some time ago, or 
and then looking at the application site and the relationship with the neighbouring property to the west. Now, Chairman, this may look like they've jumped the gun and started work. Um, not the case. Um, they have um, demolished on the back of the existing property a single storey extension and they are constructing under permitted development rights a replacement single storey extension. So um, that is what the, the works are that are taking place on the site at the moment. And as I say, that garage would be demolished. And you can see in the background the garage to the neighbouring property. Again, looking more westerly. And then looking head on into the plot um, with the house on the right, garage to be demolished on the left. Now we're around the back. So that's uh, an extension to number 26, number 28 here. Uh, and looking from the garden of, of number 28 back onto Rose Grove. Uh, we're now stood in the garden of, um, I think it's called Brennan Chairman, uh, which is the, the property to the rear on Briars Close, looking uh, generally southerly towards the, the application property and the, the site. Turning around to the right slightly, uh, and you will notice, Chairman, um, the neighbouring property on Rose Grove does have solar panels on the roof. Um, and you will see that the matter of the potential impact on those solar panels is addressed in, in the report before you this evening. Again, standing back now on the patio to that bungalow, looking generally across in a uh, westerly direction. And again, across the back, picking up the existing property and the new house would, would effectively be sat in the, the area here. Uh, again, just various shots showing the relationship of those dwellings. And then that's again in the, the same garden of that bungalow looking north, so the application site is now behind the photographer. So Chairman, this is the proposed site layout plan for the, the proposed dwelling. Um, you'll see that it's a, a L-shaped property. Um, the back section of the building, as I'm indicating, would be single storey, and that lines up roughly with where the single storey extension would be next door. Um, the area to the left of where I'm indicating now, that line, that would be the two storey section of the of the building. Uh, this is the um, the plan which was approved previously chairman um, and as I said on the previous outline planning permission um, layout was a consideration so we have effectively agreed to um, the, the, the position the layout and the footprint of that building the only matter which was reserved for subsequent approval was the appearance of the building. Um, now back onto the current scheme before you. So again, um, roughly L-shaped dwelling. Again, you can see this section would be single storey. Two storey element would be here. Um, parking in the front, here and here. And there would be parking down the side here for number 28. Uh, and that is the details of uh, elevational treatment for the proposed dwelling. Uh, Chairman, Keyworth is clearly, it is one of our areas for growth, identified in the core strategy. Um, in any event, this is a site which is uh, within the built fabric of the uh, settlement, not going to argue with you on that one. Um, and this represents a windfall plot uh, within the settlement. The uh, principle of development has already been established by the grant of the previous outline permission. Um, this is effectively a revised layout and design for the building, uh, which is now before you seeking full planning permission. Um, we have looked, as you can see in the report, Chairman, very carefully at issues of, of overlooking and the impact on neighbouring properties. Um, yes, there will be some impact. As I always say, all development has some impact. Uh, but your officers are of the view that uh, given the existing relationship of the properties, um, the positioning of this one, the proposal would not result in unacceptable impact on neighbouring properties or the character of the area. Um, you saw that there was a mixture of, of dwellings and, and types in the area and designs. 
uh, and it's felt that this one would be sympathetic to that existing character. Um, on that basis, Chairman, the application is before you with a recommendation to grant planning permission. Thank you. Right. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Pegram. And uh, we have speakers on this application as well. We also have two speakers. First of all, I have Mr. Newton, uh, who is a member of the public and is uh, objecting to the application. Is Mr. Newton with us? Hello, good evening. Yes, I can hear you. Oh, hello, Mr. Newton. I'm not sure whether you were with us earlier on, but uh, uh, we, uh, you have up to five minutes to talk to us. Indeed. And if you're still speaking at five minutes, I'm afraid I'll have to stop you. Oh, and uh, uh, you'll get a 30 second sort of countdown from when you've got 30 seconds to go. So as soon as you're ready, if you uh, want to start addressing the committee. Thank you. I hope you can hear me clearly. Yes, I thank can hear you. Everybody. Can everyone hear Mr. Newton? Yeah, yes, excellent. Can... Thank you. <laughs> thank you for the opportunity to speak to the uh, committee. I'm aware that objections to this proposal have been raised by neighbours regarding a range of issues. I've been asked to make specific points on behalf of the residents of 30 Rose Grove, which is adjacent to the proposed development. The proposed building has a boundary line only three feet away from 30 Rose Grove, looking into the living area. The house faces the blind wall of the proposed new build. The access to 30 Rose Grove will be easily obstructed by the proposed parking area of the new building. The solar panels on 30 Rose Grove will be badly affected by the two stories of the new build, reducing sunlight by over 50%. The new build is too large for the plot and out of keeping with the existing buildings. There is a concern over the major impact of extra parking on safe and workable access to the top of Rose Grove for emergency services, utilities, deliveries, and council services, including waste collections. My own objection relates to the issue of overlooking, and in particular, the loss of privacy to my property, Brecon One Briar Close. The issue of overlooking is important for us because it involves two of our bedrooms, the whole of our garden, and part of the patio. Our bedrooms and patio are not currently overlooked by property on Rose Grove or any other property, but will be significantly overlooked by the proposed development, as is clear from the site location plan in the committee papers on page 27. This will lead to a significant loss of privacy and intrusion for us. The upper north facing windows of the proposed development will overlook our private bedroom accommodation, which is less than 20 metres away and which will therefore, we will therefore find highly intrusive. It is not clear how the significance of overlooking is judged by the planning officers. I can find no published criteria that support these judgments, which therefore seem arbitrary to me, and we were not based on a site visit to my property at the outline stage. Indeed, the photos we've just seen of the rear of my property were taken after the outline permission was granted. In contrast, I can say that the distance of 20 metres is the distance at which a driver is expected to be able to see, plead, clearly read a vehicle number plate. And this gives an idea of the level of detail that is expected to be clearly visible at that distance. So 20 metres is significant in terms of being able to see to drive a car and I consider being able to see into a bedroom window. Our property is of an age where windows tend to be larger than is now the case. Our bedroom window takes up more than half the area, area of the exterior bedroom wall. The room is therefore very exposed. Bearing in mind our bedroom window is only about 17 millimetres from the proposed property, as noted in paragraph 40 of the report, and at an angle of about 45 degrees, our bedroom would be highly visible from the proposed property. This is very significant intrusion for us into our private space. I respectfully request that the planning committee recognize the legitimacy of residents' objections and therefore reject the planning application. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Mr. Newton. Um, it was well, well within five minutes, so thank you for that. And I, I think everybody, everybody was able to hear you. Uh, I was, our second speaker on this is one of the ward members, uh, Councillor Inglis. Uh, Councillor Inglis, I know you're with us, so as soon as you're ready, your five minutes will start. 
Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, committee members and officers. I've been asked to represent neighbours in relation to this application. I've had no request or contact from the applicant or his agents, and I've visited the properties. As you're aware, the previous application, 1901359, was granted outline permission. The resubmission does not equate to that of the granted outline consent, as the house has changed completely in design and an increased in mass, being 2.3 metres wider and 1.3 metres deeper on its footprint than that of the outline consent. From the consent report, it was actually noted that due to the size of the plot and the layout proposed, as I quote, the enlargement of the dwelling through subsequent extensions to the property that could potentially be constructed under permitted development could result in the overdevelopment of the plot. As such, it is recommended that a condition be imposed on grant of permission removing permitted development rights for such additions. And that was on the original plot, which was 65 square metres. This new property is 87 square metres. So given that fact, it must be over intensive according to that previous condition recommendation. As Mr. Pegram regularly states, each application has to be considered on its own merits. And I ask you to do that. This application lacks detail in its submitted plans and falls short in various areas. It creates a negative impact on its neighbours. There is no street scene elevation plan, which is considered necessary in accordance with HOU5 of the Keyworth Village design statement to show the roof lines in relationship to other properties. The committee report is clear in staying that the resulting garden will be smaller than standards expected, but dismisses it. It falls well short. The Ruskiff Residential Design Guide recommends that detached properties are afforded gardens of 110 square metres. It has been accepted on the previous established guidelines that rear garden should have a depth of 10 metres to the boundary. Even the Kiwi Village plan states a minimum of 80 square metres for a three bedroom house. The garden is reported to be a seven metre depth. That's just 65 square metres in total, minus the mature hedge at the bottom. I also note that two mature, mature trees and the hedge has been already removed from the front boundary. The plan shows that the hedge is still to be present for the new development. Having visited the site, I would welcome the confirmation that it is actually seven metres to the boundary as it does appear much less. I do not see any area designated for the three bins, which were shown on the outline plans. I'll ask you to look where they could be placed. There is just a one metre pass to the side of the house, so the siting will take away from parking or garden space. The dwelling will over sol overshadow solar panels to Walnut Lodge. It has solar panels on a single storey roof, just approximately two metres directly north of the new dwelling. From information available the sun position and sun position data, it will suggest, as an example, in early January, shadow would be cast up till about 11.30 in the morning. In July, the shadow will be cast from 5 a.m. sunrise to one o'clock across the panels. This was a consideration and a redesign factor in another keyword development on Third Avenue recently. The conclusion of the committee report can only be speculative as no shadow report has been undertaken. I think this is essential for the neighbor's benefit as it could cause a potential financial loss and conflicting with any green energy strategies. Parking obstruction is your consideration. Two places are shown to the front of the house, but one vehicle will be totally blocked in and would be unable to enter exit whilst the other is present, if the plans are correct with a hedge present. I'd also suggest it would have to be maneuvered back and forth to park across the front due to the width of the entrance and the road topography in order to achieve the necessary angle to do so. Um, as a result, I would expect the limited road space would inevitably follow um, for parking. Uh, I, I don't see the required one by one meter splays, which are required to both sides of the driveways. They're not indicated on the plans, as in paragraph 10 of the recommendations. Um, as policy one of the local plan part two, as provision of a suitable vehicle access and to pedestrian safety. So Mr. Newton has detailed the neighbours' concerns. Uh, I just don't run out of time. So in summary, uh, these factors are relevant. The mass of the dwelling is larger than was previously considered. The shadow of the neighbours' solar heating panels is relevant and not addressed. The parking spaces are questionable. The garden space is vastly smaller than Rushworth guidelines. 
The concern for me was privacy are being overlooked and recognised but dismissed. And I suggest there are no plans showing the new street scene and the relationship to other properties is limited due to visualising the over intensity of the plot. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you, Councillor Inglis. Uh, bang on uh, five minutes. Uh, so we have no other speakers on this, and uh, I'll ask Mr. Pegram to come in on the co comments we heard from Mr. Newton, who was speaking both on behalf of the neighbouring property at Ro 30 Rose Grove uh, about the, the proximity or closeness of the boundary. He says it's three feet away from there. Uh, worried about ac the access being obstructed. And, in the impact, and as we also heard from Councillor Inglis, the uh, effect on the solar panels uh, on the neighbouring property. Uh, he considers it out of keeping with uh, the area, is concerned about parking, uh, access for utilities, bin lorries, etc. Uh, and then with regards to his own property at Brecon on Briar Close, uh, he pointed out the, uh, uh, the dif distance, 20 metres between the application site and, and, uh, and his property, but in particular the worries about the impact on the privacy in the, uh, on a large bedroom window. And Councillor Inglis also pointed out impact on neighbours. Uh, it says there's been no contact with the, or he, he's not had any contact with the application. And, uh, but he also uh, makes a point that the outline planning permission at the moment has um, a, a restriction on for any future permitted development to any future possible permitted development, which could increase that. So he can't understand why uh, we're looking at an increased size on this and uh, also raised concerns about uh, parking and uh, uh, both on the property itself but also access to the road and also the size of the garden which uh, it doesn't uh, meet, meet doesn't it doesn't thinks doesn't meet uh, criteria um i think that's covered the main points uh, mr pegram would you like to come back uh, talk to us about that please chairman yes thank you. i don't intend to respond to every point i just pick up on a few of the issues um <laughs> Mr. Uh, Newton raised the issue about um, how overlooking is, is judged. Chairman, it is a, it is a judgment, um, and it's one that you as decision makers will also have to make a, a judgment on. Um, there are guidelines which refer to distances, um, certainly in terms of back-to-back -back distances. Normally, we try to achieve around 20 to 21 metres between back-to-back. Clearly, this is not back to back. It's effectively looking side on to that neighbouring property. But um, in terms of how that is judged, Chairman, that is a matter of judgment for both the officers and yourselves. Um, the issue about the um, removing oh, yeah, possible future extensions and permitted development right issues, Chairman, is referred to in paragraph 37 of the report. Um, that is referring to the current scheme, not the previous scheme. So clearly we have looked at this and feel that yes, if they were to build under permitted development extensions, um, that would reduce further the, the amenity space that is available for future occupants. Um, and you'll see that conditions five and six remove uh, permitted development rights for um, uh, freestanding structures and extensions. Um, the, in terms of the distance to the boundary, Chairman, I can only say on the, uh, approve, on the, on the submitted plans, the distance is um, scaled on the eastern boundary at seven metres. It does taper in slightly up to the, the west. So I would, uh, I think it's in the report at about 6.7 metres. Yes, Chairman, the garden space is below what we would normally advocate through the residential design guide. Um, however, Chairman, it is only approximately um, three square metres less than what we've already approved on this site. Um, and the garden area would be similar in size to that which is at 28 and 30. Given that character and that, um, not precedent would be a strong word to use, but given that character and pattern of development, um, we don't consider that uh, a refusal on inadequate amenity space could be sustained. Um, there isn't shown on this plan bin locations. We don't always require those to be shown. Um, they're about 600 by 600, I think, a standard wheelie bin, so they, they won't take up a significant amount of space. Chairman, the issue of the overshadowing of the solar panels is dealt with in the report at paragraph 55, and we have looked at that issue. Um, it is an issue which until very recently we would have perhaps suggested is not a material consideration, 
but recent case law um, has suggested that we must give regard to the impact on those solar panels. The loss of profit in itself is not a, a planning consideration. It's the benefit that those solar panels provide for um, climate change uh, improvement that, that has to be considered. Um, yes, the way the parking is laid out, potentially one vehicle would block the other one in, although that's not uncommon if you were to get a driveway with tandem parking, uh, and I don't consider that's a reason to, to refuse permission. Um, I note the point that Councillor Inglis made that the um, visibility displays are not shown on the, on the plan. Um, they are referred to in condition 10, um, and if members were minded to grant permission, I would suggest a minor amendment to that condition at the end of the first sentence to read in accordance with details to be agreed. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pegram. Um, right, we'll go to discussion and uh, debate and decision now. So who would like to uh, start off with this, please? Anyone got any comments to make? Um, I, uh, Mr. Uh, Councillor Clark. Well, I was waiting to see if anybody else spoke. But, uh... <laughs> well, yours, yeah, well your, yours was the first hand that I saw. I know, uh, I know, but I was uh, hanging. I was just seeing if anybody else spoke, but uh, no. Um, yeah, I mean, I think to a certain extent, the report is basically telling us that our hands are a little bit tied on this because. We've already got outline uh, permission, so I'm assuming that I would be correct uh, that Mr. Pegram, Pegram will be telling us that uh, the only issues that we can look at are design, scale, and layout. Um, uh, obviously, the principle is already established, uh, so I suppose the issue is the scale, um, but I, I am concerned about the garden distances um, well, we just heard on the previous item about uh, sticking to rules and then here we are uh, proposing that uh, um, a 10 meter is acceptable to reduce a 10 meter rule to seven meters uh, which uh, I do find uh, concerning um, so it would just be interesting to see if anybody else has uh, any views on that once again, Councillor Clark, Clark, as we know, each application on its <clears throat> is, is each application is different and has to be looked at carefully. Uh, Mr. Pegram. Chairman, just to come back on that point, um, I'm sure it's a matter of one is rules and one is guidance. Um, the, um, the issue about the infill plot is a policy issue. Um, in terms of the garden sizes, that is a, an advocated size in our uh, residential design guide. Uh, and I'm sure Councillor Clark will recall previous schemes where we've approved dwellings which do go against that guidance with much smaller garden areas. So it is only guidance. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pegram. Um, Councillor Brennan. Thank you. Can I just clarify about the solar panels? Um, I'm not sure you, did you directly answer the question regarding the shadowing over the solar panels, which we need to take into account climate change reasons, did we ascertain the extent to which they are likely to be impacted on? Uh, Chairman, uh, the issue there is that previously we, we felt it wasn't a material consideration. The case law um, places great weight on the government's overall policy to address climate change. Um, how, however small a contribution the, the solar panels make uh, on a single property, uh, we therefore have to have regard for the potential impact on, on those solar panels. Um, I think it's fair to say there would be some impact. Um, I don't think, um, I've not been given any uh, evidence or information to make a detailed assessment of that impact. Um, what I would say, Chairman, is that the section of the building which would be adjacent to um, that, that uh, array of solar panels would be single story. So clearly, um, I don't believe it would impact uh, early morning uh, sun or sun coming from the east. Um, yes, as the, as the sun moves round, uh, there is potential for the two story element to cast a degree of shadow over um, that, that uh, array. But it then once, once the sun moves round further to the west, 
bearing in mind, having said that, that the solar panels are on the east plane of the garage roof, um, the, the building would not cast any further shadow. Um, it is a matter of, of judgment again, Chairman. There is no specific, um, I, don't think, I don't think, I'm, I stand to be corrected, there's any science to assess exactly what that impact would be. Um, the guidance effectively is, you know, if there is some impact, you have to weigh other factors. Uh, this is a dwelling in a highly sustainable location. It's only one dwelling, but it does contribute to the housing stock for the borough. And it's therefore felt that in this instance, we have had regard for the impact, we've balanced the impact against the other factors, and we've come to the conclusion in this instance, Chairman, that the impact would not be so significant as to justify refusal of permission. Right. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, so thank you, Mr. Oh, Councillor Goland. Um, first of all, I want to say that I strongly support the idea of building in a sustainable place like this. Um, I'm looking at Google Maps again, Google's um, with the, the satellite images, and you can see the shadow cast by the existing house, which just misses those solar panels, and you can therefore predict pretty clearly where the line of the shadow will go at the time whenever this image was taken, which is, I guess, uh, mid-afternoon, straight over the solar panels. I think this could be calculated as somebody talked about a shadow survey. The thing that concerns me about this is I'm looking at the plans from the original application, which gave outline planning permission, and they are, you know, computer calculated plans, computer drawn plans, and um, I'm assuming accurate. And then I'm looking at the plans that submitted to this plan and they're apparently drawn by paper on the sort of outline uh, picture and they don't agree. Um, the boundary on the red boundary on the thing that we've been given this time come, is not parallel to the garage in the original, in, of the, on the neighboring property and on the original plans they were. So it, it looks like the size of the plot is bigger on the existing the new plans than on the older plan. The new plans don't seem to be computer generated, they seem to be drawn by hand. Um, I'm not quite sure why if we gave planning permission previously to a smaller house, we now are committed to giving planning permission to a larger house. Right, well, with regards to the type of plans, it does, I mean, as we're seeing with all sorts of different planning applications, some do are coming on computer generated, some, some do That's coming- That's fine, but one of them is right and one of them is wrong. But so, Mr. Pegram, what would you say about the, the inaccurate, the alleged inaccuracies? Um, and, uh, well, looking at the hands, Chairman, um, one shows uh, a, a straight line, or not a straight line, but a single line along the western boundary. Um, the the other plan, the current one you're looking at, shows a. Um, does show a line which steps in, but that's indicating the position of the path on the proposed dwelling. Um, there is a line which follows a very similar line to that which is on the CAD drawing, um, but in this instance they show a hedgerow uh, delineating that boundary. So again, Chairman, um, the point is we cannot specify whether drawings are um, CAD or hand-drawn. Uh, arguably, one might argue, I don't know, there's more skill if you can hand-draw um, regardless of, I, I, yeah, um, I'm, I'm not actually but, discussing. Um, so it's actually the site plan I'm looking at, not the picture pictorial plan. And I, I agree to that it's cattle drawn. Plan. Yeah, I think the the site and location plan is for identification purposes only. We wouldn't rely on that. It's at a scale of one to it says one to fifty, but I suspect that's one to five hundred. <coughs> or not the end. Um, that's too small a scale to draw any accuracy from if we were checking dimensions on site. Uh, we would rely on the um, site layout plan, which is drawn at a scale of one to 100. Ultimately, Chairman, the case law and uh, et cetera on this issue would uh, um, basically point to the fact it is the responsibility of the applicant or whoever produces the plans to ensure that they are accurate. In this instance, they are showing dimensions on the plans uh, and one would hope that they are indicating that they have measured those dimensions on site. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, did I, I, I thought, thought I saw a hand go up, but I'm afraid I didn't see who it was. Did, was someone indicating in particular? Um, no? Right. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, oh, Councillor Healy, sorry, yeah. It's, it's, the, the picture, the, the positions have changed around a bit. <laughs> uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, 
short of repeating what's already been said, I mean, I visited site today, and I must admit, uh, I think Councillor Inglis made the point, it is a, a, an obvious over-intensive development. Effectively, the proposed house is sitting in what was and still is the garden of number 28. Um, and, and certainly, whilst not entering the property, um, I struggle to see any reasonable garden at all. Um, if you look at the report, I mean, there's an awful lot of unhappy neighbours. There's some 21 points, negative points raised about the development and overlooking. Um, I see an issue potentially with parking in that certainly the pictures that we saw perhaps didn't do justice to what I saw today. There's a lot of on-street parking, both sides. It's at the top end of a cul-de-sac, which in itself presents a problem. Uh, clearly a potential... Uh, obstruction to the entrance of 30 Rose Grove. And the other thing I would just draw attention to, and, and Mr. Pregham may well clarify this for me, the application, I'm just reading something here on page 33, the application lodged, the application lodge recognizes that there has been no consultation with neighbors over the plans. I mean, perhaps for my uh, benefit, is the neighbor obliged to um, talk to his neighbors about what he's proposing or is that something that planning the borough would do with regards to signage and things we see on telegraph poles in the immediate vicinity uh, well i'm sure mr Pogo will confer but i don't uh, there is i don't think there's any requirement for an applicant to talk to a, a neighbor or whoever but there is a requirement for the council to notify uh, neighbours, which she would have done. Uh, I think that's right, isn't it, Mr. Pegram? Yeah. So, uh, and, yes, and, sorry. yeah, and, and so, so, uh, uh, so, I mean, at the end of the day, in the world of planning, anyone could put an application in for um, anything anywhere, whether it's next door or down the road or miles away. Uh, it's just the, the nature of planning. So, I mean, it's probably good practice. I mean, good neighbourly to. to to, to talk to your neighbours and say, I'm thinking of doing this, that, the other, but they're not compelled to, they don't have to. Okay, common courtesy, you're right, but clearly not obliged. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, anyone else wish to come in or will we get uh, uh, Councillor Major? Um, yeah, um, I think I'd echo some of the comments that, that have already been made. It, it's it's unfortunate that, that we are filling in what is effectively someone's garden, uh, but I think fundamentally, it's planning permission has already been granted in this place. Um, I, from my perception, it doesn't feel to me like the house has changed dramatically in terms of its size. I think it's now fatter and shorter potentially than, than it was previously um, and it encroaches on the boundary slightly. Um, but, but I don't feel that there is anything within this application that is strong enough for us to warrant a refusal. So I would move the motion to, um, to go with the recommendation. Okay, thank you, Councillor Major. Do you have a seconder for that? Anyone uh, wishing to second that? Uh, oh, hands, hands. Uh, Councillor Mrs. Stockwood. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, I, I will second um, the recommendation to grant. Um, I've not been persuaded by the arguments um, put forward. Right, thank you. Uh, so we've had the recommendation as per the report moved and seconded. Uh, does anyone else wish, wish to speak or shall we go to a decision? I'm sensing that um, the point people have spoken who wish to speak. Right, I think Mr. Sol, I think we're ready to go to uh, the vote on this one then, please. I, I think I think we, we've had a good uh, uh, discussion and, look, uh, uh, and debate. So Mrs. Sol, please. Thank you. As before, if you could, if all councillors could indicate whether they're for, against or abstaining. So Councillor Brennan. Or Councillor Butler. For. Councillor Clark. For. Councillor Gowland. For. Councillor Healy. Against. Councillor Major. For. Councillor Murray. For. Councillor Purdue Horan. For. Councillor John Stockwood. For. Councillor Maureen Stockwood. For. Councillor Thomas. Against. 
That's carried, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Sill. Thank you, colleagues. And, and again, with uh, with uh, uh, good discussion and points made, the decision has been taken. Uh, right, we uh, two more applications to go. I, I presume we're all happy to carry on. We don't not like we are in the arena where we have comfort breaks and things. So, uh, assuming we're happy to carry on, we'll go to our next application, which is. Uh, uh, this is an outline planning application at 100 between land between 100 and 112 Cropwell Road, Ratcliffe on Trent. Outline planning permission, uh, planning application for the erection of one dwelling, and this is just for the principle of uh, development. So, Mr. Pegram, please. Thank you, Chairman. I'll just share my screen with you again. Um, the application is outline. Uh, the only matter that you're being asked to consider is the, the access, uh, although there are limited details on that as well. Um, the application is located on uh, Cropwell Road, as I'm indicating here. There's a golf course opposite. Um, you carry on down Cropwell Road until you hit um, the A52 um, and the built part of, of Radcliffe on Trent. I have a, a larger plan that helps to locate the site. In fact, I think I've got, yes, I have. So the application site, Chairman, is, is, is here. Um, and you can see, obviously, the uh, main part or the built part of the settlement is here um, with the A52 effectively at this point forming the the built, the edge or the definition of the built settlement. Um, this is um, looking generally in a northwesterly direction down Cropwell Road. So the application site is behind this hedge or row of trees. Um, that would be the last property uh, on Cropwell Road at this point. Um, that's just moving in closer to look at the trees. Um, again, this is the, the this is an access um, which runs down. Um, <coughs> of the plot uh, and serves a dwelling at the rear of 112 so uh, which you'll see just coming into shot now uh, so that's set back from the road and that's the neighboring property at 112 and then we move to uh, a, a position just north uh, west or west of the access uh, into the site so this is the, the access to the neighboring property this is again the, the application site. The access would be through in this position. Again, just turning around to pick up the relationship with the neighboring properties. Uh, just head on in terms of that's the, the frontage of the site, Chairman. And then looking down the driveway to the neighboring property at 110. So the application, Chairman, as I say, is in outline only. Um, the application site is the area edged red. Um, the area edged blue is land within the ownership or control of the applicant. Um, and the uh, application plans indicate the position of the uh, proposed access. All other matters in terms of layout, scale, appearance and landscaping are reserved for subsequent approval, Chairman. Chairman, this is a plan from your local plan part two, um, showing, as I say, the built uh, part of Radcliffe on Trent. Um, obviously, uh, Radcliffe on Trent is identified as an area for growth, and you can see the indicated sites within our local plan. The application site is effectively, again, somewhere roughly down here. Chairman, the significance of the green wash and the fundamental issue in this application is that the site is within the green belt. Um, obviously, um, paragraph 143 of the MPPF tells us that new buildings in the green belt are inappropriate development. Um, paragraph 145 contains what is referred to in law as a closed list. So effectively, that list provides exemptions to development which will be regarded as not inappropriate. Um, if it's not in that list, it is inappropriate development. One of the exceptions, Chairman, is limited infilling in a village. And I emphasise the in a village. Um, you'll note from the report, Chairman, that again, we've had a, a previous appeal decision on, on this site um, where the inspector considered whether or not the site was in the village. 
Um, he took, at this point, the A52 to define the edge of the built settlement. Um, we don't have development envelopes on our uh, local plan. Uh, however, Chairman, there is reference in the neighbourhood plan to um, the, the definition of a, a development envelope in the core strategy. What that is effectively referring to, Chairman, is the inset boundary to the green belt. So effectively, what is inset is regarded as the built settlement. The area that we're talking about now um, is considered by your officers and by the previous planning inspector to be in open countryside. Yes, there are buildings, but it is regarded as countryside. Um, Chairman, this is, as I say, um, it's inappropriate development in accordance with paragraph 143 of the MPPF. Um, it is therefore harmful by definition. Um, permission should only be granted where it is demonstrated that there are very special circumstances. Um, in addition, Chairman, you must consider the impact on the openness of the green belt as a policy requirement, and clearly an additional building in that area with its driveway um, is regarded to have an impact on openness, a point again which was agreed um, with the, the inspector. On that basis, Chairman, the application is before you with a recommendation to refuse planning permission. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pogram. Uh, we, have, we have speakers on this item as well. Before we go to them, I should have pointed out that uh, two of our committee members have to stand down from this item because they are local, the local ward members. And the way uh, that uh, the committee works is if, there's an app if you're a member of the planning committee and there's an application in your ward, you have to stand down for that uh, item and also you don't take part in the voting on it. I'm sure you knew that anyway, but I just need to clarify that. So uh, we have two speakers on this uh, application. Um, the first is uh, Mr. Machen, George Machen, who is the agent for the applicant. Is Mr. Machen with us? Good evening. Good evening to you. Uh, I, I have to just let you know, I'm not sure if you were here earlier on, but you have up to five minutes to talk to the committee. And if you're still talking at five minutes, we have to tell you five minutes time is up. Um, okay. Thank you. If you start to talking to us, the clock will start counting down. So as soon as you're ready, you can start addressing it. Chair, as members of Rushcliffe Borough Council, I'm sure most, if not all of you, will know the site and regard it as lying within Radcliffe-on-Trent. It lies within the village, and this is identified by a Welcome to Radcliffe-on-Trent village sign when approaching it from the south. The site has been vacant for many years, but previously formed part of the warm side garden to the residential property, 110 Cropwell Road. The site is heavily overgrown and because of its unloved appearance, it detracts from the appearance of the area and the amenity of neighbours who adjoin the site. This application provides a clear, positive opportunity to improve the appearance of the street scene and amenity of its neighbours. The land is bookended by established housing either side of it and it lies amongst an established row of residential properties. It's very obviously an infill site. Infilling a small gap within the existing built frontage is precisely what this proposal would do. The green belt washes over this area, so we must acknowledge planning policy and what it says in relevant guidance. We consider this to be an example where site circumstances support the grant planning consent. The site represents a small infill plot where a dwelling can be accommodated without detriment or harm to the green belt. The National Planning Policy Framework states that sites falling within the green belt, such as this, can be acceptable for limited infilling. Cropwell Road is one of many residential roads and streets lying on the south side of the A52 Grantham Road in Rector Trent, and this site lies directly next to a key leisure facility, Rector Trent Golf Club. When travelling along Grantham Road towards Nottingham, it is very clear to see that the settlement of Rector Trent spreads across and straddles Grantham Road. Pavements lie on both sides of Grantham Road and there is a street lighting, making walking to the shopping centre of Radcliffe Trent safe, quick and easy. In terms of actual walking distance, the current application site is much closer to the shops and local schools in Radcliffe Trent than, for example, the major housing site under construction on Shelford Road. The site is not isolated. My client is seeking to construct a, construct a single energy efficient dwelling. This will very much be a self-built project that will advance a highly sustainable design based around excellent thermal insulation qualities that exceed current building regulation standards and reduce natural building 
materials. At detailed design stage, my client is committed to adopting good principles of passive design. The application you will decide on tonight will grant an outline planning permission for one dwelling on the size of site identified in red on the plan submitted. Details of design, appearance, size and style would be considered at detailed stage and members and planning officers would have the opportunity to discuss and agree these aspects with the applicant when the time comes. However, clearly delivering a dwelling on this site that is environmentally sustainable and of a high design quality will ensure that the very best use of this vacant plot of land is achieved. This application offers the best possible opportunity to, deli to deliver a high quality but modest development that will positively enhance the area without any undue harm to the Greenbelt, neighbouring properties or any of the council's wider policy objectives. We accept that the planning history of the site relating to its location within the Greenbelt cannot be ignored. However, the MPPF acknowledges through its Greenbelt policy that there, there will be instances where a site lies within the Greenbelt, but which still can be acceptable for limited infilling. The application site has been dramatically reduced in size and scale from the previous application submissions. This constitutes a material change from the previous application, and if it was not, the planning department would not have registered the application as valid. As members will see from the application plan, the red line site boundary has been tightly drawn, suitable for a dwelling and only immediate curtilage, making the site much smaller than previously submitted and to limit any possible impact to openness. The resulting plot would enable the applicant to build a very modest, energy efficient dwelling for himself to live in. The planning harm here is clearly negligible. The Parish Council formally support the grant of planning permission. All three local members, Councillor Upton, Clark and Brennan, formally support the grant of planning consent for this application and importantly speaking, support my client's application this evening. Some significant weight should also be given to local people supporting this application. No objections have been submitted. The, the government's national policy framework deliberately has a planning policy which permits limited infilling in the Greenbelt in locations provided the site relates well to an existing settlement. And here is a site proposal that does just that. This proposal represents small organic growth of the village, will deliver public economic benefits of local jobs in the short term and longer term social and environmental benefits of the plot complementing rather than detracting from the amenity and street seed. Environmentally, my client supports the council's wish to ensure a low carbon future for Rushcliffe. We hope you support our application. Thank you, Mr. Maitland, uh, just uh, within five minutes. So thank you for that. And our second speaker on this is one of the local ward members, Councillor Clark, please. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Uh, I'm sure you appreciate uh, I speak on behalf of all three of us ward members for Ratliff. Uh, we not only do not object, we support the proposal. This site has lain neglected for decades with a history of refusals and in my view, unreasonably so. As you will see from the plan and from a satellite view on Google Earth or Street View, this site could not be a much clearer example of an infill plot. The line of uh, existing dwellings is clearly shown and this site is fairly and squarely between two existing dwellings. However, not only that, to the rear of number 112, which is that uh, nice new big house uh, Mr. Pegram showed you, is a tandem development dwelling, 110A, recently rebuilt and enlarged in the Greenbelt, such that the dwelling is now in full view when you look down the access track. Incidentally, number 112, the last house on the road before you enter the open countryside, has just been finished being substantially extended by nearly half in the Greenbelt. Number 110 on the northwest side has a swimming pool and hard surface tennis court, both engineering works in the Greenbelt. Are you getting the drift of this, uh, Mr. Chairman? Uh, taking the golf course on the opposite side of the road into account, this site is pretty much surrounded and it is within the 30 mile an hour speed limit. The Greenbelt was established to stop development encroaching into the open countryside and settlements gradually joining up. In my view, to refuse this application brings the spirit of the Greenbelt into disrepute as it appears to be a victim of unintended consequences. The first reason for refusal refers to Greenbelt protection. Whilst protecting against unwanted development elsewhere, the Greenbelt policy is actually protecting and preserving the neglected and unkempt state 
of this proposal site. This is clearly an ideal site for an exception to Greenbelt policy. In the second reason for refusal, to say the proposal would harm the openness of the Greenbelt is quite ridiculous. There is no openness due to the overgrown and unkempt nature of the site. In fact, the Greenbelt would actually be enhanced by opening up the site through building a dwelling because the vegetation blocking the open view of the Greenbelt would be removed. You have seen for yourself the trees and hedge at the front of the site preventing any view and causing harm to the openness of the Greenbelt. The Environmental Sustainability Officer in paragraph 13 says that bats are likely to be using the site and that there is a possibility of other protected and priority species. Well, I don't think likely and possibility are things that you can go on as reasons for refusal. There is no evidence for these. And this is from a 27 year old report in 1993. We need housing sites to meet demand. We seem to be granting large de developments in the open countryside and green melt, yet we leave small infill plots that are crying out to be developed untouched. We need individually designed dwellings as well as estates with repetitive development. Again, as we hear constantly, each application should be taken on its own merits. We believe the above reasons constitute exceptional circumstances. It is our contention that this proposal is completely logical, cause absolutely no harm, and would considerably improve the street scene, as well as preserving the openness of the green belt, not harming the openness. So we urge the committee to grant approval for this application. Thank you, Chairman. Well, thank you, Councillor Clark. Uh, so we heard from Mr. Machin and Councillor Clark, both uh, very obviously and strongly in favour of the application, uh, as opposed to the rec recommendation to refuse. Uh, Mr. Ma Mr. Machin pointed out uh, some aspects about the site, including the fact that uh, there's a welcome to Rakicon Trent sign uh, 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 near the property, which would imply that it is part of uh, Rakicon Trent. Um, it pointed out over the current site is overgrown and unsightly. Uh, there, that there are established properties either side, and so um, his his and indeed Councillor Clark's opinion is that that uh, would mean it, it is in the class is infilling. Uh, he he uh, appreciates um, those policies, but uh, also as as also Councillor Clark said that uh, he regards that uh, it, there could be special. Uh, uh, special circumstances uh, could be considered here as a, a diversion from Greenbelt rules. Uh, also, there are other similar roads in Rakifon Trent and nearby south of the Grantham Road with uh, similar infilling. Um, it's closer to Radcliffe and facilities than some other properties that are actually in Radcliffe and uh, recently given permission for and considers it enhances the area without harming. And uh, Councillor Clark makes similar points. I think that's um, covered the points we heard. Mr. Pedram. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Chairman, let's start with the issue of whether it's within or outside the settlement and the significance of that. Um, as I uh, advised the committee, um, the closed list in paragraph 145 um, refers to limited infilling in a village. I am not disputing, Chairman, that elsewhere this would be would, would be regarded as potentially an infill plot. However, to satisfy the Greenbelt policy requirement, it would have to be infill in the village. Um, Mr. Machin referred to the welcome to Rush at uh, welcome to Rack on Trent sign, and uh, Councillor Clark referred to the 30 mile an hour limit sign. Again, Chairman, I'm going to refer to the inspector's decision where he said the presence of a village sign close to number 112 is not itself conclusive evidence of being in a village. Um, he, he says similarly, the extent of the settlement boundary is not conclusive evidence either. However, in this instance, I do find that the A52 Grantham Road, which is the settlement boundary, does uh, physically define the extent of the village. In my opinion, the appeal site is therefore B2 
beyond the village. So, Chairman, you've not only got the opinion of your officers, you have uh, the opinion of a very recent appeal decision and an inspector, which should be given significant weight. Chairman, the issue was referred to by both speakers about the site being overgrown and unkempt. I would urge caution in giving that matter any weight. Any, to, any applicant could latch on to that and allow their site to fall into disrepair or overgrown and try to use that as a reason for uh, developing the site. Um, he, he covered the issue of that. Um, Chairman, the, the, uh, Mr. Machen referred to the fact that the site has been reduced in area. Yes, it has. Um, the back boundary has been pulled in. However, that doesn't, in terms of the impact of the development, in my opinion, have a significant implication. The building would still be, once the hedges are cut down, still, still very visible. Um, the fact that the PC, uh, the Parish Council, I should say, and the fact that there's significant um, local opinion um, should not be given significant weight, Chairman. Just to remind you, um, Section 38.6 of the Planning and Compulsory Purchase Act requires that development is determined in accordance with the development plan. So the starting point for this application, Chairman, is your development plan. Um, that was that one. Um, yes, the building to the rear of 112, Chairman. Um, <coughs> I've checked historic mapping. There's been a building on that site from somewhere around the 1950s, 1960 point. Um, the replacement of a dwelling in the Greenbelt is or can potentially be not inappropriate development. So that again does not give, give weight to the argument in this instance. 112 has been extended, yes. Again, the closed list in paragraph 145 includes extensions to dwellings where they don't result in a material increase in size. Councillor Clark referred to engineering works within the green belt. Um, paragraph 146 of the NPPF sets out other types of development which may be not inappropriate in the green belt, and specifically mentioned in that list is engineering works. Um, uh, Councillor Clark referred to an issue about bats. Chairman, we're not refusing this application on bats. Um, there's no recommendation to refuse on the ground of bats. Um, and the other issue which has been referred to previously this evening, uh, the issue that we have um, large developments in the countryside, some in areas where we have um, effectively removed the area from the Greenbelt. Those are sites which have been allocated in your local plan as part of a planned approach to deliver the housing that this borough needs. Small infill plots of this nature are never going to address the need that we have for housing in Rushcliffe. This is more unplanned development um, and as I say, um, we have a development plan, we allocate sites to ensure that we can meet our housing needs. Yes, that has resulted in some sites being removed from the green belt, but only after a very careful examination of the issue, including by a government inspector. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Pogrom. That's uh, uh, picked up those, those points. Uh, so, uh, right, we now need to start uh, discussing and coming to decisions. Uh, on this one, please. So, uh, um, uh, uh, right, does anyone wish to, to start off with uh, this, please? I don't see a, a lot of hands going up yet. I've got, oh, Councillor Thomas, and then Councillor Goland. Microphone. I think there's been a very recent um, appeal decision um, on this um, application, on a very similar application. And I don't think the size of the um, reduction in the size of the plot for development um, changes the inspector's arguments at all. It wouldn't, you know, the, the smaller plot wouldn't change those arguments as you, that were made by the inspector. Um, so I would... Um, refuse the application thank you right are you uh, you're being quite forthright there are you in effect moving a recommendation at this stage or um, are you just making uh, making a point oh just making a point at okay. this stage right okay thank you uh councillor goland please 
Um, first of all, I want to completely support Mr. Pegram. I think the fact that the area is overgrown is not a, re a material issue. In fact, if anything, it's a positive thing. It's uh, increasing biodiversity. And again, the Google Maps images looks like a lovely bit of woodland there. However, that said, um, if we're going to build anywhere, it seems sensible to build here between two houses on a main, reasonably main road. So, you know, as these, someone said, it seems a slightly sort of uh, smells of unintended consequences that this is inside the green belt, but it is between a load of existing houses. Um, yeah, that's all I've got to say. Thank you. Um, Councillor, Councillor Major. Sorry, I can't find the right button. Oh, that's not the right button. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it is unfortunate that it is a, what looks like a prime plot, but I can't, cannot see the inspector coming back and, and changing his mind in terms of where the outline of, of Radcliffe Village is. And I think on that basis, I don't, I don't think we have any choice here. I don't think that any of the stuff that's been presented today to me speaks to exceptional circumstances to to remove this this piece of land from from the green belt it does seem ridiculous that it is clearly an infill plot but we do need to honor the the letter of the law with the green belt um and it is quite clear in this situation that this this isn't within the village um from my perspective so um yeah i i think i would be happy to move the motion to to refuse permission all right okay thank you but does Mr. Pegram wish to come back on that uh, on those two previous comments? I should have asked before, but I, I yes, no, thank you. Um, right. Um, uh, did I see an, uh, uh, Councillor Thomas? I was going to second. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So we have the recommendation as per the report moved and seconded. Does anyone else wish to make any comments or observations or? counterpoints at this stage. Uh, uh, Councillor Goland. Sorry, it's a question really. Um, okay. the, the comment about the planning, um, the, 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 the um, inspector, presumably if we were to accept this planning permission today, it wouldn't go to the inspector, would it? The, it's no, there's no root way that would be re referred back. It'll only be if we reject it. That's correct. Okay, right. Um, any other, or shall we go to a decision on this? I think, again, this is uh, one of those decisions that um, in members have to weigh up between uh, between the, the application and the arguments from the applicants and the supporters and the policies of the council and national policies and all the rest of it. So that's what we're here to do. Uh, so I think Mr. Sol will, um, Go through the roll call, I think, on this one, please. Thank you. Councillor Bunce. Confirm this is the recommendation as per the report. Yes. Yeah. Councillor Butler? Uh, against. Councillor Gowland? Sorry, I'm confused. Uh, I'm in favour. <laughs> Uh, sorry, I, I, I um, uh, support their planning application. Sorry, I'm confused what I'm voting here. against the recommendation. So you're against the, let, let's start, you're against the application. I, I, yeah, I mean, the, the motion, if I can have clarity, the motion is to refuse permission. Yes, that's right. So the motion, motion or against the motion. Right, okay. I'm against the motion. Councillor Healy? Against. Councillor Major? For. Councillor Murray? Against. Councillor Perdue Horan? For. Councillor John Stockwood? For. Councillor Maureen Stockwood. Or. Councillor Thomas. Or. That's carried, sir, Chair. So can you just confirm the, the decision on that, Mrs. To Selby? refuse. So, permission is? The motion to refuse is carried. 
Right, okay, so that means permission is, so there is no permission. The, it, <laughs> the motion is carried as per the report. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Chair, sure. could we have a brief comfort break, please? Yes, I think so. Uh, I'm not sure who asked for that. Was that Councillor Thomas? What time is it? It's, tw it's just gone 20 to nine. We won't, mustn't be too long because we've got uh, one more application to go and there's also the there'll public speakers, a public speaker on that. How long? Five minutes? It's that, yes. And now technically, what do we do? We stay logged on. Do we, do we just turn our cameras and microphones off? Right. If, oh. if everybody could turn off their cameras and microphones and if everybody could come back at 8.45. Uh, yes, let's let's say 8.45. Yes, please. Yep. See you in a moment. We're all gradually getting back.
I'm here. I'm just going to. Are we on? Four, eight, nine, ten. Four, eight, nine, ten. Who's missing? Francis. Oh yeah. yeah. I've only got nine members, Chairman. I can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven now. I think we're all here, aren't we? Is Mrs. Soul back? I think we're just missing Count the Poetry. Yes. Uh, Oh, put a count. Where, where's for, yes, Francis? <coughs> here in two seconds. Okay. It gets confusing when this pictures jump around, doesn't it? And move, move position. I, I can see Councillor Perdue Horan, but he's still got his video um, off. off and his microphone off. As has Councillor Gowland. Ah, oh, Councillor Gowland's back. I'm eating, that's why I'm hiding. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Perdue Horan is still... Oh, no, he's, he's back with you now. Right, uh, good. I think we're all... Yes, I think we're all here then, aren't we? So, yeah, we're, we're, are, are we transmitting and things, doing what we have to do? And Yes. Okay, Yes, right. yes you are. Right, thank Thank you, everybody. Thank you, colleagues. And thank you, uh, visitors, for your patience. Um, we'll go on to our next application now, which is our final application for this evening. Um, this is uh, uh, Tolleton Hall, Tolleton Hall, Tolleton, change of use of part of Tolleton Hall and grounds to Swede, uh, I'm not sure if I pronounce this, three generies with uh, permanent retention of associated building. Mr. Pegram will confirm whether I've uh, 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 pronounce that correctly or not, and Mr. Pegram will talk us through the application, please. Thank you, Thank you Chairman. Close enough. Um, <laughs> Chairman, there was a late representation um, just clarifying the description and the nature of the development that you're being asked to consider this evening. Um, it is um, change of use of part of the Tolleton Hall um, and, the, uh, and the erection of a building within the grounds of the property for use as a car, effectively a car dealership. Um, just for clarification, in case anyone asks, Chairman, sui generis means that it's Latin, I think, but it means it doesn't fall into any identified class. It's in a class of its own or not easily categorised. Um, this is a retrospective application, Chairman. Um, so the building is in place. And as Councillor Clark has often uh, commented, we therefore have a one-to-one -one model to consider the application against. Uh, this is the uh, Tolleton Hall here at Tolleton. Um, property is on Tolleton Lane, um, has extensive grounds. I don't think you can quite see it in the uh, image, but effectively um, the land in the control of the, uh, the applicant includes all of this that I'm indicating. So it is substantial grounds to the hall. Just to zoom in a little bit closer, um, the hall itself, Chairman, is grade two listed. It's effectively a... a L-shaped. Um, the hall has been um, used for various purposes over the years, including a, a members club, um, hunting lodge, um, offices, uh, more recently um, changed back predominantly to residential, um, but with the addition of the, the car sales that you are considering this evening. Um, there's two, really two elements to this application, Chairman. One is a change of use of part, well, change of use of part of the site, but part of the building for the, the car sales purpose, and a freestanding building in the position I'm indicating here. So this is the, um, I'm not sure, we had a debate earlier, Chairman, which is the back and the front of the hall. Um, the, uh, there is a, an access from the north and the south, um, and this is the looking from the southern access across the car parking area at the, let's say, the rear of the building. 
Um, the part of the building which um, they are using for car sales includes the garage, which I'm indicating, and accommodation on the ground floor here for offices. Um, that's now stepping back outside the sort of inner enclosure. Um, and you can see the hall. And um, we now pick up the building, which forms part of the application you're considering uh, this evening. Um, now focusing more on that building. Um, and then turning around, looking back out of the access with the, the building behind us effectively. Again, looking at the building, it's a um, profile metal sheet roof with a, uh, it's not timber, but it's effectively timber effect cladding to the exterior of the building. Um, just looking now, that's the end of the building with the lean-to on the end out into the grounds of the hall. Um, looking head on at that lean to section. And then just stepping back um, with some different views uh, around that site. So as I say, Chairman, that's the section of the hall which is currently being used for car sales. And there is the building, uh, which although we don't need them, we've seen it in the flesh. That is the details of the building in question. Uh, Chairman, there's two fundamental issues here. Um, one is Greenbelt, again, I'm afraid, um, and the other is um, the impact on the setting of the listed building. So again, Chairman, the uh, construction of new buildings within the Greenbelt is considered to be inappropriate development. Uh, we don't consider that this satisfies any of the um, items listed in the closed list of paragraph 145. Um, the, the other aspect, which is um, very important, Chairman, um, is that being within the grounds of a listed building, Section 66 of the Planning, Conservation Areas and Listed Buildings Act requires that you give special regard to, to the desirability for preserving the listed building and its setting. So it's not uh, a matter of, um, there's no impact on the fabric in this case. The fabric is effectively remaining untouched. Um, but you are required to look at the impact of the building on the setting of, of the listed building. Breaking it down into its component parts, Chairman, arguably, given the history of the site, um, there is probably no objection in planning terms to the use of this area for car sales. The, the issue uh, we, we have with this application is with the new building. For one, we consider it to be inappropriate development for which no very special circumstances exist in our opinion. Um, and the other chairman is that your conservation officer considers that the building does impact adversely on the setting of the listed building. In this instance, it is less than substantial harm, but in accordance with the policies in the MPPF, any harm must be given significant weight. Where there is harm, you have to balance that harm against the public benefits of the scheme. And again, Chairman, uh, there is no indication of any public benefits which would outweigh the harm that we have identified. Um, I should mention that it's um, the, the owner of the property lives on site, operates the business from site. He does sell uh, what you might refer to as high-end or luxury vehicles. However, Chairman, what you're being asked to consider tonight is a car dealership. So it's, you should uh, not give regard to the type of vehicles, it's a car dealership. Um, for the reasons I've, I've outlined and that are set out in the report, Chairman, this is before you with a recommendation to refuse planning permission. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Pegram. Uh, we have a speaker on this item as well. We have one speaker. Uh, this is Mr. Kershaw, who is the architect. So is Mr. Kershaw with us? Yes, I think so. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, yes we can hear you. Yes. Uh, thank you. So uh, I'm not sure if you were here earlier, but uh, uh, you have up to five minutes to uh, address the committee. And uh, as you approach five minutes with 30 seconds to go, if you're still talking to us, then you'll get a, 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 a message saying you've got 30 seconds to go. So as soon as you're ready, uh, you can talk to us. So thank you. Over to you. Okay, uh, well, first of all, thank you for allowing me to speak. Uh, I appreciate that. And um, I think Mr. Pegram actually outlined that very well, what, what we're trying to achieve here. Uh, for my part, I've, I've spent the last three years uh, and millions of pounds on this estate. I'm, I'm really trying to do justice to uh, 
the grade two listed building and the surrounding areas. And not just inside the wall, but I've planted hundreds of trees and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make this place far better than it was. I've tried to do things correctly <clears throat> and to a high standard. Um, and the request for retrospective planning approval was actually made by myself uh, because I was previously under the impression that planning was not required because there was actually a building there before um, where I put my building. In fact, there were three different buildings. I think it's actually listed in your officer's report. Um, so, and also mine is technically a temporary building, which I moved from Langer, another site I had uh, three years ago. So this little um, storage building has been there for three years um, without any objection. I had a specialist heritage consultant come in and she was very happy with uh, how it looked in accordance with the hall. There was no harm as far as she could see. Uh, also two sides of it are completely invisible to anything and anyone. Um, it's only the, the side that faces the business um, that you can actually see it. But the main point I'd like to make is that the officer has concluded that this is a slight harm issue um, and a marginal decision. So I'm hoping that you can consider the other side of the argument, which is to look at what the cause, what the, what the harm would be to remove the building. Um, but simply, if I take the building away, the business is not viable. Um, it's actually a supercar and vintage car business. It's a very small business. We have one or two sales a week, but they are quite high value. And the items that I need to store are extremely high value, uh, some in the millions of pounds. I can't store them outdoors. Uh, they have to be in a proper shelter and they have to have proper security. So the building is uh, important in, in so much as I just would have to shut the business if I didn't get approval. Uh, in addition, there are five people that work in the business. They would lose their jobs. Uh, the council would lose the business rates, which is currently £17,000 a year. And I would lose an income stream that helps me to maintain this vast property. The officer states in point number 17 on the um, report that harm cannot be justified because there are no wider public benefits. But I've, as I've just said, I think that's not true. Uh, my business would close, people would lose their jobs, and the council and my staff would lose income. Uh, I've had many, many visitors come into the hall. Obviously, I've, I've caused quite a stir by, by renovating it and putting it back into a home. Everybody has commented on how um, well we've done. And this building itself, it, obviously, they saw the building that was there before, has received praise for, um, for how it looks and how it blends into the environment. It, it, it looks more like an agricultural building. Uh, what was there before was particularly ugly. Um, the work I'm doing will probably will make sure that everything here is in, in, in good shape for the next hundred years. And I was hoping for support from the council for a, um, allowing my business to operate, um, which I think is probably something that you do seem to be in favor of, but it simply cannot operate unless this storage building is allowed to be within the permission. Um, so I'm simply asking that you bear this in mind, particularly in the current economic crisis we're all in. We don't want to lose jobs and shut the business down simply for a building that is a marginal and slight harm issue to the green belt. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kershaw. Uh, that uh, was, uh, we heard, uh, um, heard you came through very clearly. Uh, so Mr. Kershaw has just told us uh, that, that um, as well as the building itself, he's, he's uh, putting a lot of time and investment into the, uh, into the building and the, and the overall estate. Um, he says that there was a building on the site before and that uh, this, this uh, separate building is a temporary building which was moved from a previous location in Langer. Uh, he says it's not actually visible or very visible from uh, outside the curtilage of the hall. Um, and uh, he told us about his business and uh, the potential impact on that and the other effects. Um, I think that's the main points that uh, Mr. Kershaw has made. Mr. Pegram, do you want to just come back on those and then we'll go into um, Not at this point, Chairman. I suspect there may be some points of clarification from the committee, but no, no nothing to respond to on that. Right. OK, then. Thank you. So um, we'll go to uh, the uh, to, uh, to debate it, discussion, debate, discussion, debate. So uh, does anyone wish to start on on this one, please? Yeah, uh, Councillor Clark. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I think at this stage, I just want to get some clarification from Mr. Pegram uh, on uh, what uh, Mr. Kershaw said regarding 
uh, this building replacing some previous buildings. So uh, could Mr. Pegram, sort of, what history does he have on record uh, as regards uh, what previous buildings were there? I appreciate if this uh, was built some time ago, then obviously we weren't able to investigate it, but I, I don't even know, has it been through building regs? Does anybody know what was there before? Chairman, um, the, the, as I said, the hall's been used for various purposes, and I think at one point, even as an educational um, establishment, um, there were some buildings in this position. Um, I don't have the details of those available to me at the moment, um, but clearly they are now gone, um, and you must consider the, the application on the details which are in front of you at the moment. Thank you, Chairman. As a clerk, that helpful? Come back. Um, not especially, no, Chairman. <laughs> um, uh, I'll, I'll, um, I'll, I'll keep considering. Oh, right. Um, okay. Um, can, can I ask? Uh, uh, oh, sorry, Councillor Brennan. Thank you, Chairman. Um, can we just have the slide back up that shows the building next to the hall, please? That would be just a second, Chairman. Oh, no, sorry, it was uh, that one. Yeah. So, so can it's I ask, the, the gate, sorry, Chairman, can I go back? You're on, yeah. Thank you. Um, so those gates, is that the main entrance to the hall? Or is that private, that's presumably private land in front of the gates as well as behind, is it? Uh, bear with me, Chairman, and I will, I will go back to uh, this plan. Um, <clears throat> Those gates are probably there, if you can see that. Um, the building is there, the hall is there. The, what you can't see very clearly on your screen possibly is that the area of land which is within the control of the applicant um, includes, effectively is the boundary is around here. Um, so these other buildings are within uh, the control or the ownership of the, the applicant. That photograph is taken from uh, roughly this position. So yes, it's from private land, arguably, looking through those gates, uh, picking up the two buildings and the relationship. Thank you. So this building is not visible at all from, from the public space? Um, I, I believe there may be footpaths in the area, Chairman, but it is, um, it's not visible from Tolerton Lane, I would hazard a guess. Okay, so it's not visible from the public realm, as far as we can ascertain. Not from Tolerton Lane, Chairman, I don't think, no. And do we have any sense of the other buildings which are in close proximity to the hall and whether they are in, of a similar style? Um, uh, let me just see if I can spin round um, while I... Right, if I share again, Chairman. So um, there was a previous permission on this uh, area for extension and conversions of the stables. So I'm taking that from my research to be these buildings. So they are more of a substantial build than, than the building we're talking about here. Um, and then obviously, oh, go the other way, no, to the top. Um, probably the best one. So there are, there are other buildings of uh, substantial construction. Um, again, Chairman, I haven't been to the site myself, but I think in terms of this area here immediately, this is the only building of this nature. The others are of a more substantial construction if that answers the question that Councillor Brennan had. Is that helpful, Councillor Brennan? Yes, thank you very much, Chairman. Yes, it is. Um, I, 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 I got a little query, actually, that on this application and in others we've had tonight and in the past when we're talking about Greenbelt applications, uh, we often talk about special circumstances, having to meet them. Is there anything in the guidance referring to, to 
um, whether business is uh, sort of sustainability of a business could be regarded as a sort of special circumstance, special circumstance. So um, I, I'm just wondering if, if there's anything, if that would be uh, an argument. Um, Chair, unfortunately, this is where the legislation lets us down. Um, it asks us to consider very special circumstances, but then gives no indication of what those um, are. Um, it is effectively for the decision maker to determine whether certain factors may be very special circumstances. Uh, Mr. Kershaw has referred to, and in fact, um, I'm remembering now, there was a consultation, and I'm trying to remember whether it was brought into force, but um, the committee can, on any application, the committee can give regard to um, other financial benefits that could accrue from an application, even, for instance, um, business rates or council tax, which can be um, a factor to be weighed in the balance. Mr. Kershaw referred to um, employment, business rates. Um, the, the main one, I think, which he referred to, which I would say can potentially be a very special circumstance, uh, all may outweigh the harm from the building, is the, the fact that if this business is able to operate from this site, it does provide, if you like, a financial um, contribution to the upgrade and the upkeep of the hall, which is a listed building. So again, the policies do talk about maintaining buildings in their um, in a, a viable use to keep them, you know, um, in a good condition. The where we would differ to a certain extent, there, Chairman, is arguably um, the building, the freestanding building, could be placed elsewhere within the curtilage where it may have less impact on the on the hall. Um, I'm sure if Mr. Kershaw could chip in, he would argue that it needs to be there for security reasons. But again, security in itself is not a, a material consideration. So yes, some of the factors that have been referred to could amount to very special circumstances or factors which may outweigh the harm, but it's for the decision maker to consider that and weigh in the balance. And clearly your officers have done that in coming to their recommendation. Okay, thank you, that's, that's helpful. Um, Pascal Major, please. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking at the whole site um, on Google Maps and it, it's obviously slightly out of date because this building doesn't actually appear there. But from my perspective, just to pick up on what Councillor Brennan was suggesting, this doesn't appear to be visible from, from public land. You can't actually go down the road in, with Google Maps because it's obviously private and they, they won't let you spy that closely. Um, and it's in it's in what is effectively a car park. And I think if you were to try to suggest that there would be a better place for this building to be, the options would be perhaps in the you know next to the very picturesque lake. And I would suggest that that is far more detrimental to the overall um, scene than it is in its current state. From from my perspective, I can't personally see that the harm that this is doing to to the building. I think it's it's clearly at the back of the building and supposed to be in where the sort of the utility area is and where the cars are parked and and to me it doesn't take anything more from the hall than a bunch of parked cars would um would particularly given that it's a lot of concrete in that area anyway and it's quite a utilitarian space um so i i, I personally can't see that the harm would outweigh the benefits that are clearly being brought to this area through the business and through the, the income that is supporting the, the uh, maintenance of, of what is a grade, listed, grade two listed building. So I'm struggling to see who is losing in this scenario and why this isn't, is, wouldn't be something that we could support and, and allow to exist in its current form. Okay, thank you, Councillor Major. Uh, two more hands have gone up. Uh, the first one by a whisker was Councillor Clark and then Councillor Thomas. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. Um, a very interesting appraisal there from uh, Councillor Major. Uh, and your question, uh, which could be repeated uh, slightly differently, only you talked about business and my main contention was in relation to jobs, uh, which I know is very much the same thing but specifically I'm uh, talking about the actual provision of jobs itself and it was interesting Mr Pegram's uh, response there as regards you know the weight that could be given to that um, I'm not sure 
from a public perception point of view that we should be giving a lot of weight to um, the, the income to the council uh, specifically um, because that would probably wouldn't go down too well. It wouldn't go down very well, no. <laughs> Even uh, um, so <clears throat> I'm not really, um, I'm, I'm sort of trying to split them a little bit, but uh, I'm concentrating more on the provision of jobs. And also, uh, and Councillor Major was quite right, uh, when you look at, which I've just done, you look at the uh, Google Earth, Google Maps, what do you want to call it? And of course, when it were, <clears throat> when Tolleton Hall was an office block, or building, uh, there was a substantial number of cars all parked there, and I would have suggested that uh, I can't remember how many cars used to be parked there, but by the look of the Google Maps, could be sort of 30 or 40 cars. Uh, I would have thought that would have been considerably more detrimental to the uh, listed building than uh, th this building. So I agree, it is a question of weighing it up, and I, I can see, yes, there are arguments in both directions and I I think Mr Pegram was sort of he didn't say so but I think he was sort of hinting it's pretty finely balanced uh, and um, the, the jobs thing is is definitely ringing in my ears. Well, thank you Councillor Clark uh, just before I go to Councillor Thomas Mr Pegram you, you had an expression on your face there as if you wanted to say something to come back on that. Yes chairman only in terms of whether this is finely balanced, the, there's a difference between policy uh, in this instance and the duty you have under the uh, Listed Building and Conservation Areas Act. So in the case of a policy, you can interpret and give weight to different factors. In the case of the duty under the uh, Listed Building and Conservation Areas Act, it is a statutory duty to have regard for the um, desirability of preserving the listed building and its setting. And the policy tells us we must give that significant weight. So I don't want to downplay that one. Um, and there have been numerous legal challenges in terms of how that has been interpreted and the weight that people have given to it. So it's, um, I, I'm not suggesting it's finely balanced, but that, that issue carries quite some, you know, some, some significant weight. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Thomas, I think you indicated, didn't you? Yes, yes thank you. Um, as far as I can see, there are two aspects to this application. One is the change of use, and the other is the retention of the building. Um, on the side of the change of use, um, the justification being given, really, is that it's a sort of luxury um, um, car sales operation that's appropriate in this location because it's a kind of luxury building um, and that the volume of traffic is small because the number of sales are small. Um, so my sort of thought is though that would that change of use allow it to be used? I'm not saying that the applicant would want to do this but could you just turn turn it into a sort of vast area of you know clapped out Ford Fiestas or whatever a second-hand car dealership of a very different nature so that was the question on the change of use side um on the building again um the, they're talking about using the building for parking these very expensive ca cars um but does the change of use allow that building to be used for something else in the future that would be less desirable? Um, is the building um, a permanent building? And can any of these sorts of issues be dealt with by conditions? Chairman, thank you. Um, uh, yes, you are being asked to give permission for a car dealership. You are not being asked to give permission for a car dealership which sells high-end vehicles, although that's what this particular applicant does. So arguably, if you gave permission, yes, you could get a national dealership in there selling run-of-the-mill cars, not, not the high-end cars that are involved here. Um, I think the in answering your questions, coming on to um, the conditions and what that building could be used for, um, if you were minded to grant planning permission, I am now thinking that the conditions that you might impose would be firstly limiting the use to that which is applied for, i.e. a car dealership, um, to, to sort of address the issue of it becoming a, um, a run-of-the-mill, you know, ordinary car dealership, 
I would suggest you could potentially make it personal to Mr. Kershaw. Um, and uh, in terms of the building, Mr. Kershaw himself referred to it as a temporary building. And again, if you were minded to grant planning permission, you could consider a condition which said the building shall be removed if that use ever ceases. Does that pick up on all of Councillor Thomas's points? Uh, Councillor Thomas, does that pick up on your points? Yes, those were the sorts of conditions and, and, and things that would, um, you know, make the uh, proposal more um, acceptable as far as I'm concerned, although it doesn't deal with the issue of the harm to the setting of the listed building. Actually, Mr. Peckham, your, one of your answers to Councillor Thomas there was, going to, was an answer to a question, another question I'd got, or a, a suggestion or question, and that was, if we were minded to grant permission, and bearing in mind we've heard it's a temporary building, could there be a condition on that said that should the business stop, fail, I, I'd hate the word fail, but if the business is no longer there, that the building would then have to go because it's no longer related to the business? So if you could just clarify that. Yeah, yes, you, uh, I don't think it would be unreasonable. It's not a brick built building of any significant um, um, substance. So uh, I do think in this instance, it wouldn't be unreasonable because we have to make sure that conditions are reasonable. Obviously, if the car business did cease and the owner wanted to retain it for some other use, he would have the, the option to apply again at that stage. But as I say, I don't think it's an unreasonable condition to put on if that's the, uh, the thoughts of the councillors. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. Uh, uh, Councillor Tom, uh, who, uh, Councillor, who had the hand up? Councillor Thomas, did you have your hand up again? I did, yes. I was just going to ask if there's any um, conditions possible relating to the volume of traffic that would be generated by the business. Thank you. Chairman. Uh, yeah. The design and access statement which accompanies the application says that the, the business operates 8.30 to 18.30, Monday to Friday, no Saturdays and Sundays, um, and it says that it's by pre-arranged appointment. appointment isn't it? Now, again, that's one of the factors the Highway Authority took into account when they determined whether there would be an unacceptable impact on the highway network. Um, and again, we have controlled um, activities um, by condition, uh, and referred to supporting documents. Uh, Councillor uh, uh, Gowron. Um, I would like to move that we accept this application subject to the conditions that Mr. Pegram has spelt out, such that if the uh, change of use, there's a change of the business on the site, the building has to be either removed or new application has to be put in. Right, thank you. And Councillor Clark. Up the microphone. Sorry, Jim. Uh, just for a second, that uh, could Mr. Pegram just clarify um, in the uh, the bit about um, that uh, clients would be by appointment only? Um, is that enforceable? Uh, I suppose. I'm not suggesting Mr. Kershaw would, but um, uh, somebody could say, oh, well, if you turn up, just just uh, say we've got an appointment. Um, I know that's not in, in his interest uh, because of the nature of the vehicles he's selling, but I, I just want to be clear as to, um, you could, there's no point in putting in condition on if it's not enforceable. Uh, and that's one of the tests, yes. Um, all I can say, Chairman, is we have done it previously when we've restricted the way a business operates. Yes, it is difficult to enforce. Um, I think because of the, um, if, if you do restrict it to Mr. Kershaw um, and the nature of the business, well, you know, his business is of a nature where um, I don't think everyone goes down there and buys a couple of cars, for the sound of it. Um, I, I think having done some research, Chairman, um, I think it's fair to say that Mr. Kershaw may sometimes operate um, sort of open days uh, by arrangement again. Um, so again, I, I, would, I guess that would, that would generate the most vehicles potentially, um, vehicle movements. And, um, but again, that would fall within the category of by prior arrangement, I would suggest. So it's not an easy one to enforce, no, uh, but we have done something of a similar nature previously. Yeah, Chairman, well, I, I think um, 
the, it is finely balanced, um, but uh, I do think that uh, the way it's been presented that, uh, and with it being a listed building, it's in Mr. Kershaw's interest to uh, look after the estate uh, and make sure that um, it isn't abused. <clears throat> so uh, I, I think if um, uh, Councillor Gowland is uh, agreeing that um, we impose, well, we put conditions that it is personal to Mr. Kershaw that should the uh, use applied for cease, then the building will be uh, removed from the site. Um, I'm not quite sure what other um, conditions would be appropriate, but uh, I'm certainly prepared to, uh, to second that. Thank you, Councillor Clark, and uh, and uh, Councillor Golan. I, th I, th I saw you nodding. I think so. You're happy uh, with that, um, right? So we've we've got a, a, another different recommendation then moved and seconded. Oh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Pegram. Sorry, Chairman. Now we have a motion which has been seconded, and again for the purpose of the minutes, I do need a clear indication from the motion and mo the mover and the second. It's getting late. Uh, the clock here says it's 20 past eight, incidentally, but um, <laughs> oh, <it's not. laughs> um, yeah, I do need a clear indication from the uh, person who made the motion and the seconder um, why uh, you are approving permission for um, inappropriate development in the Greenbelt, which has harm to a uh, building. I know we've discussed it, but I, I need it uh, clearly stated for the purpose of the minutes. Um, can, can you think, have you got something in mind there? Um, back in my brain. <laughs> uh, because it's a temporary building, because in my opinion, its location, where, where it's located with respect to the listed building, does not significantly impact on the listed building. Um, does that address your points? I don't know if uh, Councillor Clark can say something else. Uh, well, I, I don't know if Mr Chairman would just be helpful. Uh, just uh, I would say that approval will be given for the um, use applied for uh, due to um, the weight given to uh, em for employment uh, purposes uh, uh, outweighs the harm to the listed building uh, and then for the and to have the other conditions as uh, as we've already uh, talked about and I I, th I think there was another condition that Mr. Pegram was suggesting in his previous conversations, and I can't for the life of me remember what it was. Can you remember what it was, Mr. Pegram? Uh, making it personal to Mr. Kershaw. Oh, well, I, sorry, I'd already suggested that, and also the removal of the building. I yeah. thought there was, was another one. Uh, well, personal removal of the building operating in accordance with the details that are in the design and access statement, i.e., um, 8 oh, by appointment only. Yes. Yeah. Is that sufficient, Mr. Pegram, for the benefit of the minutes? Um, <clears throat> I, I, should well, on this. I think I, I think I can sense the, the feeling of the committee. I just need to make sure that we are making a robust decision where we have clearly understood and uh, addressed the issues. Just to come back to Councillor Gowland's point, um, she said it doesn't cause, has a, have a significant impact on the building. Uh, just to address that issue, in terms of the legislation, um, you either have no harm, you have substantial harm, and then you have a vast void in the middle, which can be less than substantial harm of a varying degree. So any impact on that building, which is deemed to be adverse, is harm. And therefore, you need to make sure you have... Um, considered uh, other factors which amount to the public benefits of, of granting permission. Which is why I made the uh, suggestion, Mr Chairman, that uh, I was saying that the harm to the listed building is outweighed by the uh, com um, provision of commercial business in, uh, and employment. I'd always um, uh, be keen to increase employment. I'm slightly worried if we put too much weight on that, if they could open floodgates to many uh, commercial build, um, developments in the Greenbelt, because there's always, <laughs> jobs are always going to outweigh um, uh, the environment potentially. Um, but I think that the, um, 
reason I don't think this is causing any harm in this location is because it's on a car park, which is frankly a pretty ugly car park from what I can see. Um, and, uh, um, you know, along a load of Leylandi, it's not a, an, an attractive location per se, compared to the rest of the building and the rest of the site. It's also not visible from the public domain. Yeah, I would yeah it's not visible from the public domain. Mr. Pegram. Uh, Chairman, just to come back, sorry, I do need to make sure we get this right. So am I sensing what Councillor Gowland is now saying is that the development causes, in her opinion, or your opinion as decision makers, no harm to the listed building? Yeah. Councillor Gowland. Yeah. And it's temporary. And it's temporary. Uh, Councillor John Stockwood. It's my understanding that there's two issues that would need to be addressed. One is the harm to the green belt and the very what very special circumstance would outweigh the resultant harm and two the impact on the setting of the listing building and what public benefit would decisively outweigh the harm which arises from the proposals so it may be uh, in the interest of the committee to acknowledge the harm in those two situations and say that having given due consideration to those harms you acknowledge them, but you say that there is a very special circumstance which you've identified as um, economic benefit or, or it, the other matters that you've raised, and that um, the public benefit is the contribution to the maintenance of the listed building that you've suggested. So I would, I would strongly suggest to committee that you consider acknowledging the harm that has been caused in those two scenarios and stating we recognise the harm but to the green belt, but you all have identified a very special circumstance and that you recognise the harm to the listed building, but that the public benefit is that the building will be maintained through the economic um, development or the it becomes a sustainable um, contribution through because economic um, is, is a form of contribution to sustainable development. And I think um, it may be in your interest to say, yes, there is harm, but there are factors that over out, outweigh it, I would suggest. Which is, Mr Chairman, that's exactly why I said that the harm to the listed building is outweighed. I didn't say there was no harm, but the harm was outweighed by the, the benefits. And I saw vigorous nodding from Mr Pegram, who wants to come back. Chairman, yeah, yeah, just, um, I, I may appear hard at these times when I do this, but I need it to come from members' mouths, not my mouth, because you're the decision makers. Yes, absolutely. What Mr Stockwood has said, Councillor Stockwood has said, is exactly, um, and now that he said it, um, that if, if anything is less perverse than suggesting the building causes no harm to the listed building. Um, and I think I am now satisfied if, if that is, I think Councillor Gowland moved it, Councillor Clark seconded it, but if they are both happy with that explanation, that is what I've noted down. Perfect. It's a perfect explanation. Yes. Uh, yes. Good. Uh, right. Okay. Uh, I, I, I'm no, not seeing any more hands. Thank you, Councillor John Stockwood, for your clarification and help on that. That's that's very helpful. Um, I think uh, unless there's anyone else wishing, wishing to speak, let's go to a decision on this. So we've got the uh, a, a new recommendation to grant permission with the conditions that we've just spent quite a lot, long time confirming and discussing. So, uh, Mrs. Soule, please. Thank you. Uh, just run through the order then one last time. Uh, Councillor Brennan? Oh. Councillor Butler? Oh. Councillor Clark? Oh. Councillor Gowland? Oh. Councillor Healy? Oh. Councillor Major? Four. Councillor Murray? Four. Councillor Purdue Horan? Four. Councillor John Stockwood? Four. Councillor Maureen Stockwood? Four. And Councillor Thomas? Four. That's carried, Chair. I thought that was unanimous as well, wasn't it? Yes, so. it is. Right, thank you colleagues for that. That's uh, a very good debate. So permission is granted for the, uh, for the, the, the building uh, and the, with the conditions we uh, gave. Uh, right, that's the final planning application for tonight. The next, the only other item on the agenda 
is to note the uh, a recent planning appeal. Uh, do you want to say anything about this, Mr. Pegram, or it's fairly? No, Chairman. Unless there are any questions from from members about the appeal. Does anyone have any questions, Mr. Councillor Stockwood? Are you yes. What was the what was the figure in pounds, shillings, and pence, please? That was the question I was expecting. Um, we don't know yet. Basically, the the inspector has awarded costs. Um, it's for the applicant to claim those costs, um, and it will obviously amount to well. Effectively, I think there were three reasons for refusal from memory. Um, the uh, the two in particular that caused us a problem was one that we could not provide evidence to. Um, defend the, the uh, reason on highway grounds, but he were not objecting. I haven't said that for a couple of meetings, actually. Um, and the other one was um, lack of information uh, with the application where the inspector felt there was more than enough information with an outline application to consider the impact or the potential impact of any development. Um, and those are the, t I think they're the two issues um, where um, costs will be awarded and it will be the reasonable costs in defending those two issues. So it could be, for instance, the cost of a, a highway engineer, for, in, for instance, or a highway consultant. Thank you. The answer is we don't know, but we think we've got an idea. Uh, uh, right, okay, uh, no other points on that. So we'll move towards, well, we, no more items on the agenda, so we can uh, declare the meeting closed at, um, uh, 9.32, I think, by my watch, give or take a minute or two. So th can I thank everybody for their contributions? And also, I think the technology held up quite well. Uh, and also, tonight's meeting was a very good example as to how committee is not afraid to make its own decisions, sometimes against recommendations. And I think it's an example of uh, democracy and all the rest of it at work. And I know it's been a difficult, it gets your head spinning and the cogs turning, but... Uh, I th thank you, thank you all very much. Our next meeting is, I think, the thirteenth of August, or is it the thirteenth or the sixteenth? It's thirteenth. That Thursday in August. Um, I know it's. We don't like to have council meetings in August, but because there is so much going on in the world of planning, we, we can't really not have one. Um, I I don't think we know yet for sure whether it's going to be online or actual. I I, I assume we're waiting for further guidance on on that. We yes, we are, Chair. Yeah. Yes. Right. So, so basically, listen up for further news uh, in these still very challenging, difficult times that we're, everyone's going through. Um, so, unless anyone else wishes to say anything, we'll say good night and thank you very much, and see you or speak to you soon. <laughs>